For over 15 years, Saturdays and Illegal Curve have been synonymous with one another. With insight, analysis, and interviews regarding the Winnipeg Jets, the Manitoba Moose, and all around the NHL, here are Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsberg, and your host, Drew Mandel. The Illegal Curve Hockey Show, presented by Play Now, the official sports betting partner of the Winnipeg Jets, starts now. Good morning, Winnipeg! Good morning, Manitoba. For all those joining us live this morning on our YouTube channel and all of our social media platforms, we say good morning, universe, and welcome to the Illegal Curve Hockey Show with Dave Manu, with Ezra Ginsberg. I'm your host, Drew Mandel, here for the next couple of hours to talk about the Winnipeg Jets, the undefeated Winnipeg Jets, I might add, 4 0 after their convincing victory last night over an overmatched San Jose Sharks team. Gentlemen, great to see you both on this Saturday morning. Big thanks to the good folks at Play Now, of course. They're the presenting sponsor here of the Illegal Curve Hockey Show and the Illegal Curve Post Game Show. Gentlemen, it's been uh, less than 12 hours since we last got together, but it's nice to see you both on this uh, Saturday morning, red and orange day for us at Illegal Curve, apparently. Those are two great colors. And boys, the dream is alive. The dream is alive. <laughs> the Jets can still go 82-0. and It's pretty incredible to think that the Jets have never gone 4-0 and in 1.0 or, or 2.0 history. It just shows you how good of a start that is, right? But uh, look... Even though the, the Sharks scored three goals, that was uh, as as dominant a, a performance that you could really ask for last night. So we're going to get into it here. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the Nemesnikov line got off the schneid. Nice to see. What do they have? 10 or 11 combined points. Nick Ehlers, uh, his best game of the year, right? So uh, excited. Thanks to, to Richie. Yeah, yes. thanks, thanks to Richie, to Richie the, Bauer the Bauer rep. rep. Yep, By the right. way, Richie, if you're listening and you want to you know, grease us with a little bit of uh, Bauer merchandise, you can uh, feel free to get in touch with us. We are not uh, we are not unwilling to shill as we uh, for for free products as well. Well, R- Richie is influencers. R- 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 yeah. Richie and friends have been all over our Instagram for that post that I posted on the illegal curve Instagram. And uh, Richie's friends are saying that Richie is going to be insufferable to ah. play hockey with and to be uh, around in general after that big shout out. So, uh, yeah. Well, if anybody knows anything about insufferable, it's us at Illegal Curve. So uh, we'd, we'd fit in very well with Richie and friends in that case. Uh, the numbers, Dave Manuk through four games uh, speak for themselves. Undefeated, of course, that puts the Jets with a winning percentage of 1,000. That's pretty good. Top in the NHL in goal differential at plus 13. Uh, mm-hmm. You look at the, the Jets, you know, on the backs of last night's performance, now have seven players averaging a point per game i'm saying all these stats folks tongue in cheek it's very early but the numbers are pretty impressive the uh power play is the best power play in the nhl and in history and in history yes of course a 50 percent success rate and the penalty kill not too far behind eighth in the nhl right now at an 85.7 percent rate so things clicking on all cylinders, firing on all cylinders for the Jets early in this season, Dave Manouk. Yeah, and I think the the two things that I'm going to take away from there, because clearly the, you know, the undefeated uh, thing, and even the goal differential is pretty impressive right now, but it's the special teams for me. And it's the power play and the penalty kill. And sure, they gave up the power play goal yesterday, but I think that the key for this Jets club is that return. We're not seeing a ton of creation at five on five, obviously more yesterday than we did in the previous three games. Dave, that's so, because the Jets were on the power play for half the game last <laughs> night. Well, it's interesting because that's one of the things that Scott O'Neill talked about was that, you know, he said, it, will it be a game that looks like there's going to be a lot of power plays? And that's, you know, that's what it ended up being. And, and the power plays were largely because the Jets controlled the play and the Sharks had right. no other alternative but to take penalties to try and slow them down. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know it. Like I said, we we heard from Dean Shin with the uh, PK coach this week, and you know he just talked about the momentum that they feel like it's just his philosophy. He talked about the penalty kill philosophy, and I'm just saying that he said it's it's going to take a bit of time because it's more aggressive than what this team has employed in the past. Which you know we've talked about how sometimes they're very passive both on the power play and on the penalty kill. Mm-hmm. So they're going to be a more aggressive team in that regard and and a quicker team. And and that probably works to their strength. So that's a that's to me is probably a good idea. And and so far, early obviously, and level of competition needs to be taken into account. Chicago, San Jose, um, even Minnesota to a certain degree. 
Uh, so you have to factor all those things in, of course, but you want to see that the team is having success because one, it's always easier as he, once you've kind of gotten that start to kind of try and maintain that to a certain degree, you're not going to maintain like, you know, 40% on the power play and a, and a pretty much perfect penalty kill. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that you're going to be able to, you know, ride that to a certain degree. You're going to feel good. Your power play is going to, both units are going to feel good about themselves. The penalty kill, both those units are going to feel good about themselves. And to me, that that really is what is key because you can bring that into the season. And that's one of the areas we talked about for the majority of last year, which is this team, you know, 52 wins, 110 points, but their special teams were abysmal. Now, even if you don't get to that 110 point, I mean, let's be realistic, the Jets are going to finish with 164 points. But even if you don't get as he to that, <laughs> you know, that, that same mark in terms of wins and points, if your special teams are top 10, that's going to be very good for this Jets team moving forward. Yeah, there's no doubt that the special teams have been good early on. And, you know, we're throwing out a lot of numbers here. And we talked about this last night on the postgame show. It's it's really remarkable that the Nemesnikov line had 100% Corsi 4. Mm -hmm. And something that wasn't really talked about, uh, but I guess I'm going to talk about it here, is they, the Nemesnikov line barely had more ice time than the fourth line. And this is courtesy of Garrett Hole here in his... Uh, in his uh, five hole newsletter that I'm su su subscriber to. And the other thing too, is the Shifley line actually didn't have a very good line uh, night at even strength. So that show the Drew, I know you're already frowning yeah, here. I mean, I look, <laughs> I, no, I, I, look, you, there's a, no, but the I, reason... I, I think there's value. There's definitely value in, in analytics, but to, to, you know, everything that happened from that first period on yesterday, or for it is that second period on yesterday is almost has to be thrown out. I mean, it, it's just, you know, the score effects are so dramatic in that game. It's so one-sided. Look, I get it. And I, and, and I saw those numbers and I was concerned about them, you know, at, at first glance as well, particularly the performance at five on five from the Shifley, Velarde and Connor line. But that game is such an anomaly that I, I just don't think you can you can read that much into it, even from the, uh, uh, and I say that from the as impressive as the Perfetti's line performance was as well. It's just I mean it, it's it was such a men against boys performance last night that mm -hmm. I don't know how much value and I think even Scott Arneal alluded to it in his post game comments. I don't know how much value you can you can find in the last forty minutes of that game because it was basically already over as soon as Kyle Connor scored, uh, you know, early in that second period. I think you could argue that the game was over even before that. I think the game <laughs> the game was over, you know, when Ehlers scored his second goal, and the the Jets were up three one, right? So mm -hmm. it, you know, I, I was going to finish my point, Drew. You didn't yes. you interrupted me. Sorry, you didn't even let ahead. me put context to the numbers. I just mentioned the numbers. I didn't even make a point there, but. Uh, the point I was trying to make is that the Nemesnikov line coupled with the power play was so dominant that you didn't even notice those things. That's what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. Nobody, Nobody's going to remember those things from that game, and nobody was paying attention really, aside from maybe Garrett Hole and I, to those numbers. Um, but I, I think there's no doubt that early on the power play has been a big story. And also the, the, the story has been that the Jets have not been reliant on one or two lines, right? You go back mm -hmm. to the season opener against the Oilers. It was all the Lowry line. And then obviously, you know, Shifley and Connor got some goals on the power play. And, you know, the Jets just continue to, to pile up goals. And, and the goal totals were actually a, bit, a little bit lower when you consider they only scored a couple of goals against Chicago and Minnesota, right? So really last night was just all about I think that Nemesnikov line getting going. And yeah, you're right, Drew. I mean, that line isn't going to have 100%. They're not going to outscore. <laughs> they're not going to outshoot their opposition 11 nothing every game. The Sharks are a terrible defensive team. The yeah. goaltending is bad. Uh, even though, like we talked about, you know, you bring in a guy like Cody Cece on the back end. I mean, and Matt Benning, like, I think he was there last year. But it's just not a very good team. And the Jets took advantage of it. And that's what they're going to do. You put a weak opponent in front of the Jets, they should beat them 8-3. You're right. Exactly right. And that's, I think, to me, the takeaway from the game of, of last night is that the Jets went out there and they didn't toy with their opponent. They didn't, you know, play down to their opponent's level. Uh, they just went and they said, OK, this is this is not this shouldn't be competitive and it won't be competitive. We're just going to end it real early and real quick. And that's certainly, I think, a very good sign from the Jets is that there's no. I mean, and I, I, you know, there's, there's no selfishness. There's no disrespecting the game. It's let's just go, let's perform, let's win. Let's have an easy win because we know that in the course of an 82 game season, Dave, it gets to be a grind. 
and it yeah. gets to be hard. And, the, you know, it's hard to win oftentimes in the NHL. And it's a struggle through 60 minutes. So that when you can have a performance like this, where you go out and you end the game after 20 minutes for all intents and purposes, it feels pretty good in the room. It allows the coaching staff to just sort of keep cycling guys through. You don't have to worry about line matching. You don't have to worry about who's out there against uh, which opponents. You just, okay, okay, next line over the boards, next line over the boards, next line over the boards, because you know that by and large you're going to be, you know, after 20 minutes, the game's over, and you're going to win the the majority of the rest of your minutes. Yeah, and and to the thought you just had, I I would concur, right? The idea is that you know Scott O'Neill can thereafter use guys you know freely, and he doesn't really have to be worried about matching. He doesn't have to worry. He still wants to play his game. He still wants to implement yeah. the game plan that they created, you know, ahead of the hockey game, right? As but at the end of the day, you know, you want to know that. As you said, Drew, you've you've able you. This is something the Jets didn't do last year. They weren't able to like. How many times did the Jets have tough games against Chicago, who was a much worse team last year than they are this year, or against San Jose even? So you had, and obviously the San Jose games, especially largely were, were goaltender related. But I'm just saying that the Jets to to do that to that. I don't think it requires a lot of analysis. You know, we did that last mm-hmm. night in the show, and ultimately, you know, this is not a, a powerhouse team. So you, you, you beat up a doormat, which is kind of what you do to doormats, right? And you, I, what I, I guess I And by the way, that, having Macklin Celebrini and Will Smith in the game would not have changed anything. It would have given them more talent and more skill that you'd have to be aware of, but the Jets were still going to be the better of the two teams last right. night on paper, certainly. Yeah, and I just, I guess what I'm saying, though, is that, that you, did, you did what you needed to do in the hockey game. Your right. special teams continued to work well, and more importantly, you got that, Nemesnikov line going that to me was the biggest and and again was it because it was against the Sharks was you know the comments that we had heard from Nikolai Ehlers earlier that day that his line had spent you know he loves playing with those guys he they had spent time you know watching video working in practice if they're going up against Dallas does that line I don't suspect they have the same Corsi numbers and I don't suspect that you know the stat line necessarily looks the same but my point is that do they have that sort of good feeling that's nice by by Spency, but like they Say it for they, the podcast. Yeah, they were definitely lacking Lacklin the Celebrini. <laughs> Very nice Spency, who's also now known as God's gift to the YouTube chat. First Very of all, nice. he, he appointed himself as God's gift to YouTube Self-appointed. chat. Self-appointed. Self-appointed. Yes. Self-appointed. I'm not sure yeah. about how that uh, that totally. That's not works. true. God appointed him the gift okay. to the YouTube chat. <laughs> Pretty sure it's sacrilegious to be making those uh, kinds of comments, but that's okay. Anyways, the, the, the fact of the matter is that... Sacrilicious? Uh, what did you say? <laughs> that's a different, that's not, that was my French toast this what he morning. Said. But anyways, the point is that, you know, this is... You, you were able to get out of the hockey game what you needed to get out of that hockey game, which is two points and a lot of good feelings. That's Special a good teams. way to put it. And, and again, like I said, that second line, the one we had been watching, wanting and watching to see what they were going to be able to do, what they were going to be able to put it together. They did it yesterday. That's what you want to see. And now, as we've talked about and some folks are saying in the chat... Now you put that game behind you and you focus on the next one. Well, so let's talk about moving forward and we'll get deeper into the Penguins game a little bit later on in the show. But just a general look at the schedule as we, you know, in the lead up to last night's game, there's a lot of talk that it's every second night, you know, for, for the next you know number of weeks. And you mm-hmm. look at it. I mean, I think the next time the Jets have a two day break between games uh, isn't until after the game uh, against the Florida Panthers. The, they have that home and home against the Panthers. Uh, so on Tuesday, November 19th, they play against the Panthers. Uh, I guess, sorry, I'm missing one. After they play Dallas on a Saturday night, then they have two days off, and then it's back to two in a row. Uh, Did Drew just then, reference a game on November 19th? Well, yeah, that's what the here? schedule it's is October every second. October 19th. <laughs> the, the schedule is every second day. I mean, that's so the Jets are, you know, into a bit of a grind as they were talking about. Now, there's not a back to back in here until the 22nd and 23rd of November. But, you know, after that four day break that they had last week, it is every second game. So it's every second day the Jets are going to be playing. It's easy to schedule uh, in your brains as to when the Illegal Curve postgame show will be. It's the next night if it's not that night. So it's pretty straightforward at that point in time. They have seven games in the next 13 days. Well, there you go. Including last night's game. That's that's as a game every two days as you get because that's literally what they have, right? <laughs> right. So it's it's a tough stretch. And it was kind of weird, right? Like we talked about it a little bit. Like you're not used to seeing a four-day break in mid-October, right? Like it's just... Every team is going to have these weird, and also we should mention, right, the, with the Four Nations tournament in February, 
that mm-hmm. you're going to see kind of like every year we talk about, you know, these weird parts of the schedule, Drew, but yeah. like this year, it's going to be even more condensed and, and weirder, right? So yeah, there's going to be lots of hockey, but that just means lots of post-game shows and we get to hang out with Spencey and the crew. There you go. It's great that we have all those post-game shows, but the Jets sort of need to be, uh, you know, they, they need to take that opportunity. And then, you know, after the four day break, they need to now sort of recalibrate themselves. It's great start to the season. You can't take anything away from them four and oh, I think if everyone, had, if you'd asked anybody about, you know, the, the start to this Jets season, you would have said, okay, yeah, you got to make some, Hey, you got some weaker opponents, uh, especially after the game against Edmonton, you have some weaker opponents that are coming to to Winnipeg to play against the Jets. Now let's see how they do in those games. Well, they've acquitted themselves excellently. We know that we can see that. And you got the Penguins on Sunday again, a team that is got you know some great talents, of course, in Crosby and Malkin, and both of whom had those milestone nights earlier this week. But after that, isn't Malkin the, leading the league in points? Right? I think he's I think close. He is. Yeah, he's got he's 11, 11 points in six games. Pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, looks like they've found the fountain of youth. I mean, he's played more games. Somehow, Carolina's only played three games. I don't know if you guys noticed that. They had Carolina's that postponed. Played, well, they, had, they postponed. Well, no, I know, but Carolina's, uh, Carolina's only played three games, and I think the Devils are up to seven or eight. It's just kind of weird to have that disparity. And obviously, the Devils started against the Sabres in Prague, but mm-hmm. just kind of, yeah, you're right. I mean, Carolina did have the games postponed, but um, and we should factor that in, that Pittsburgh's played six games, and and the Jets have only played four, right? So, but I mean, look, they score a lot of goals, but they give up a lot of goals. Yeah, more um, than anybody, I think, has he? Yeah, so, I mean, the Jets should be able to continue to pile up the goals, and it'll probably be Bloomquist in net, as opposed to Tristan Jari is really struggling. Like, we talked about Mackenzie Blackwood. I think Jari was injured, too, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe he's just sitting right now. But Mackenzie Blackwood really struggled last night. Tristan Jari is a guy who, what did he get, a five- or six-year deal, guys? And they're kind of starting to wonder, like, what's the future of, of Jari in Pittsburgh? So we'll wait and see what happens there. Because um, I think Bloomquist started last night, didn't he? Uh, I think that sounds right. I'm pretty sure that Jari did get the night off last night. To, I mean, he's got a, his save percentage is 836 and a goals against average of 5.47. So he definitely wow. needs a, a little bit good? of time is that good? away. Yeah, is that good? No, it's not great. By the way, the, I, yeah. for the record, I misspoke. Pittsburgh has not given up the most goals in the league. That'd be Colorado at 28th. Right. And Pittsburgh's second. Uh, You're talking about big goal. win Colorado last night. Yeah, big win having to come back against Anaheim. Yeah. The Penguins have given up 25 goals. Uh, so if you look at it on a goals, yeah, I mean, they're giving up more than four good? goals a game. No, it's not good. I know. <laughs> I know it's not. But the Jets need to, again, take advantage of that. They want to, they've had the successful homestand. They want to continue that successful homestand and wrap it up with a perfect record on home ice before they have to hit the road uh, for the three where they go against uh, the St. Louis Blues, the uh, Seattle Kraken, and then the Calgary Flames. So, but the Jets, uh, my point is, they have to keep the the good momentum going. They've done a lot of good things so far early this year. And that was a question is how is this team going to pick up with a new head coach, albeit one with a lot of familiarity in Scott Arneal, one who was behind the bench, uh, you know, last year in this associate role or assistant role and interim head coach for a couple of times while Rick bonus was away. But, the Jets need to sort of continue to make hay that they've made in October and November the last couple of years because that those 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 solid starts to the season have propelled them into mm-hmm. the playoffs for the last couple of seasons. No, I don't think there's any question. And I think that's one of the things that we've talked about for years on this variety of shows, whether it's a Saturday morning show or a post-game show, is how important and impactful these these ga- early season games are for the Winnipeg Jets. So if you're able to to do what they've done, which they've never done before, which is get to start off with eight points out of eight opportunities to for point or eight point potential points. Yeah. And they got all they got 100 percent that that's significant because it, it'll help when you have that lull. But as Vlad Domestikov you know touched on yesterday, this is one of those Things that listen, they 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 had that luxury, they no longer have it, and I think the positive for the Jets, regardless of outcome, but for like you know the next game or two, but I think the positive for the Jets is that they're they're feeling really good about a lot of different things. Even though Connor Hellebuck didn't have a strongest night, he's looked no different, you know. And I'm sure there's a lot going on with him yesterday, right? As with the celebration, he is obviously very, you know, because. It's interesting to hear him talk, right? He talked about celebrating that the his achievements, but with the fans in Winnipeg, and you could see that that rousing ovation that he got was was you know had a had a had a 
you know, played a role kind of impacting him. And I'm not saying in a negative way. I'm just saying like, you could see just from the way he was reacting that, you know, he really was appreciative of the, I guess, adulation that he was receiving from the crowd. But Jets fans like, are are not shy, Dave, to let Hellebuck know how much they love him, and I and you know he appreciates it, right? Like, right. It goes back to what we talked about when Shifley and Hellebuck signed, right? Like, Hellebuck could have chosen to go elsewhere. He wanted to be here, right? And he's here. He's got his second Vesna, and he's obviously working on his third Vesna. Um, but I mean, you, more you love importantly, he, his first Stanley Cup. <laughs> well, yeah, obviously, you know that that's that's what the ultimate goal is for for the Jets and and most teams, not the San Jose Sharks. Sorry, guys, you're not winning the <laughs> cup this year. Uh, but it, I mean, you could listen to Hellebuck. At least I could listen to Hellebuck uh, talk all the time uh, when he's spe- especially referencing how much he loves playing in here with his teammates and everything like that. And that's one thing too that you're seeing. Like, obviously, winning helps that, Dave. And sorry, I don't mean to to uh, steal your thunder here but yeah i mean like the jets they're having fun like they're they're winning games and they're having fun and they're 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 really appreciative of how how well hellebuck is playing behind them yeah and, and, and just i agree with you and the, the having fun is a very key factor and, and i don't remember who said that but one of the guys i think it was scott o'neill had referenced that yesterday or the day before uh just about them having fun but but more importantly is that they're building good habits and that's and again the the five on five play through the four versus well, three games mm-hmm. is something that you want to see improved upon. But to me, the most critical factor was the special teams. And 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 the penalty kill was was not good last year, to, to put it mildly. And the power play had stretches where it was better and improved a little bit, but it wasn't consistent. By the and way, then, uh, what, what happened to Shifley and Connor on the PK? Nobody's talking about that. <laughs> that was a training <laughs> camp storyline. I, I, Who called yeah. that? Who called that? This guy. There you go. Well, once in the once in the blue moon, you you got something right. Congratulations. The blind squirrel found the nut. But yeah. uh, I think I think the the key for for Winnipeg is is that is that you're gonna hold on to those really positive elements that you've created in the first you know couple of weeks of the schedule or however long it's been. I can't remember when our first game was. Was it ten days ago? Was it October 9th? I think it was the first game. Yeah, the Wednesday. So 10, that's right. It's only it's only been ten days. It feels already we've already been a lifetime, but it's only ten <laughs> days in. And, um, but no, this is one of those situations where, you know, you've been able to, and you know what we should mention the flurry and Miller pairing has, has worked well. And that's mm-hmm. one thing that, you know, Scott O'Neill has talked about. So but you flurry those, struggled a little bit last night though, Dave, oh, a little bit, but, and especially, you He's know, coughing like said, the puck up. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think what it comes down to though, is that, you know, you've got a team that is created those elements Drew, to your point that you should, even in a condensed schedule, be able to say, listen, our power play is not going to change. The structure is not going to change. The penalty kill. Like, those guys have learned that it works. Even if it's only four games in, they're seeing the results are there. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to coach someone and say, trust me, it will get there. But now these guys have already had that success, so they're going to have a lot more trust in, you know, the, the Davis Payne and Dean Shinway systems. And obviously, Scott O'Neill has had an impact as well. But But those systems and i think that to me is going to be critical factor moving forward in the next you know 20 games or whatever it's going to be i think what was so important for the jets at least to start this year is to see how they were going to build upon what build upon the structure that was put in place last year and that was i think a big question anytime you have a new coach behind the bench again albeit one with the familiarity that they have with scott or neil the question is largely going to be how is the team going to respond how is the team going to you know, pick up where they left off in terms of the good habits and how do they flush some of those bad habits and start to rebuild them. And so far, as I would say that the jury is definitely uh, come back with a positive verdict on the Jets building on that. I mean, you look at five on five goals against the Jets have given up four five on five goals against so far this year. And I mean, and, and that, and you'll take that every single day right. of the week. That's if those 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 are the like you you want to be giving up one even strength goal or less per game. You're gonna win one, games. You're gonna win the majority exactly. of your games if you're giving up one even strength right. goal a game, especially when the power or when the penalty kill is no longer atrocious. And I think boy, exactly. And I think boys, like you you know, you start off that game against Edmonton. We talked about it. I mean, you know, you you dream about those types of you know, opening season, season opening, I should say, victories on the road, right? Like mm-hmm. six nothing. Like you really can't ask for much better than that unless you're asking for, I guess, seven nothing. <laughs> but I mean, the point is they were dominant and they shut down McDavid and Dreisaitl and company. Right. And yeah, the games against Chicago and Minnesota, there were like, we talked about like Drew and I, 
did the post game show against the after Chicago, and there was definitely some Scott Arneal called it spacey moments in that game, and against Minnesota that was tight checking, and usually those games are one goal games, but then you have an opponent after having four days off, and you absolutely stomp on their throats, and that's what you like to see. So you've seen two dominant victories out of four, and then you've seen a couple where yeah you could have lost a point in overtime, but you didn't. You found a way to get that extra point in overtime. So, I mean, you're you're a perfect four for four, and it hasn't been perfect, but I think what you're liking is the fact that not only are the special teams clicking and you're getting contributions from all four lines. Like, again, the fourth line was really good last night. We talked about Alex Iafallo chipped in two assists. One was on on the power play. One was at even strength, but... The fourth line has a po- has a Corsi four percentage of just under sixty eight percent through the first uh, four games of the year at five on five. Right, and, and I mean, you're, you're, about you, that. that's a strength of the team. Like, yeah. like on on a weaker team, like on the San Jose Sharks, Morgan Barron is probably playing on the second line. Mm-hmm. Like, no joke. Like Alex Ifl is probably playing on the second line. Like well, the Sharks are obviously a team of third line guys. Um, but the point is the Jets have one of the stronger line AHL lines. guys, but that's like, <laughs> and we could do that, guys. You know, that's an exercise maybe for like next week or whatever. Like, how does the Jets fourth line stack up? I, I would uh, I would have no problem saying that it's, you know, a top third of the league in terms of their fourth line, maybe even better. Well, right now, it certainly is right now. They're you know, the, the way they're performing, they just go out there and they win their minutes. So mm-hmm. I mean, unfortunate it, David it, Gustafson. I don't know when he's going to get in the lineup, but uh, Rasmus yeah. Kupari is playing well. Yeah, right now, you know, you wouldn't. There's no reason to expect anything to change up. I know coaches always love to get, want to get sort of that thirteenth forward or that seventh defenseman into the lineup, you know, so they're not sitting for weeks on end to start the year. But you know, justifiably, how do you make a switch right now? Who are you taking out when that fourth line is is just not not just winning? It would their be minutes. Kupari. It would have to be right just well, as a but, center. I don't think you're you're not taking out IFL or Baron right now. I just think they're playing well. Him? How do you take Kupari out right now, especially because he's sort of a younger player who's probably feeling as good about himself right now at the NHL level as he has since becoming an NHL regular? I just don't think you can seamlessly make that swap even for one game, Dave. Well, and again, why would you? I mean, you're winning. So, you know, we know the coaches are loath to to make adjustments when you have a winning formula. And again, these are not all perfect wins unless you're the Domestikov line. But the fact <laughs> of the matter is that you know, those other lines gave up shots against. I mean, the Mestikov's line says, I don't think so. But the the truth is, Drew, that it, it's hard to see him making a lot of adjustments. And and Scott O'Neill himself was asked about getting those those guys in, getting replacements in, you know, the the guys who are waiting in the wings, if you will, the Dylan Coglins and, and David Gustafson's and eventually Logan Stanley, because it sounds like, you know, he, as should probably be mentioned, he switched to a yellow, uh, from yellow non-contact to a regular jersey on Thursday. Still a ways away, but, you know, at the end of the day, he's going to be there. You're gonna, they're going to want, are they going to want to get him into matchups or are they going to con- stick with what they've got? And of course, you got to deal with injuries and stuff like that. But ultimately right now, especially with Kupari, especially with Kupari, because I think from what Scott O'Neill said, they really want to give this guy uh, uh, to pardon the phrase, a long runway. Mm. And I think that uh, that is, go- you're going to see that. They want to see what they've got in him. And especially while the team's going, I think there's a good opportunity to kind of like unleash him a little bit and let him have that opportunity to play, you know, 10 games in a row and really get a chance to kind of evaluate his game, right, Ezzy? And not have to just yeah. say, okay, well, he played two games. I, now now you're going to have a, a longer cha- viewing channel for the for the, for the staff. He's 25. Like, I think we know what – do we not know what Kupari is? Like, he's 25 now. I, like, I, to me, it's that he's playing well. Yeah. Like, to uh, me, it re- it's more, Dave, that like you said before, you're not going to take him out. You're winning and he's playing well. But I don't know if this, like, this argument of we got to see what we have in him. Like, don't you have enough – Oh, I think you're he's not, he's I mean, 25 if, if years old. Are, I, sure, but I mean, if you're the Jets, how does he work within your structure? Because last year they didn't really get a chance to evaluate him because he was injured and he was kind of behind everything. I'm just saying that he played 30 games, though. No, I know. I, I, look, I, I, I'm not suggesting that Rasmus Kupari is a second line center in the in 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 waiting. I'm just saying that from everything Scott O'Neill has said, he just wants to see what he can do healthy. And within the structure, and and that's no, I know, I, think, I know. I just, think, I, I just think essentially he's played better than Gustafson. That's what it ultimately comes down mm-hmm. to, right? Well, yeah, and I like, I'm a big fan of Gustafson. I think well, Gustafson also like got hurt at the him. wrong time, right? Sure, but you know, right now it's tough for him to get into the lineup. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, right. Like, I, I, but he's not. I think Kupari's staying in for the foreseeable future, the way he's playing on that fourth line. 
a good problems for the Jets to have all systems go as of late as the team is 4-0 and early in this 24-25 season. When we come back, the show's going to get a hell of a lot smarter. Murat Atesh of The Athletic is about to join us. Ginsburg just went into the ether as well. There he's back. <laughs> Stay tuned. It's the Illegal Curve Hockey Show presented by Play Now. Drew Mandel, Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsburg with you on a Saturday morning. Bottom of hour number one, welcome back to the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsburg. I might task Mr. Ginsburg with finding out where uh, Mr. Atesh is as he's set to join Probably us. sleeping in again. I know. The poor kid is very sleepy. Somebody's got to wake that, wake him up, set an hey. alarm, something like that. Murad. Some of us were up wet, much later than Murat, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning. You're Boys, I hope bed. I didn't tell Murat that we were on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, that would have been that would have been a mistake on your part. I know that that one week uh, anomaly may have confused things, but that would have been a, an error on your part. In any event, we'll get Murat Atesh set to join us momentarily. Uh, of course, this show brought to you by our friends at Play Now. Don't bet on illegal sites. Bet with Play Now instead. Manitoba's local legal and secure gambling site, eighteen plus. Enjoy responsibly. Big thanks to Play Now for their continued support of the Illegal Curve post-game show. Uh, as I was, uh, or I was going to mention, I was going to bring it up with Murat, but we'll do it now. Jets and the Penguins tomorrow, the Brian Little Appreciation Day. I don't know, is that much, um, Dave, you know the official title of the of the day. Is that, is that what it is or something along it's, those lines? It's, it's a Brian Little Retirement Day, I would call it. He's, you know, signing a one-day contract to retire right. as a member of the Winnipeg Jets, which is, Pretty significant given all he's done for this organization, whether it was on the ice or, you know, off of it when he accepted a trade to the, or he waived his, I should say, no, no move clause to go to to Phoenix, to give the, sorry, Arizona, to give the uh, Jets some cap flexibility. So uh, I think, I, and I think he, because of the way he ended in November of 2019 yeah. and the fact that it's the Jets, not that you always get a chance to say goodbye to a player, but I think for Jets fans, it, it really is going to be a, a nice opportunity. And for Brian Little himself, who really didn't get a chance to say goodbye to the fans, uh, I think it'll be a real nice opportunity for him to have that experience and for the fans to have that experience, right? As he to be able to say, you know, to voice their appreciation as we heard for them with them for Connor Hellebuck. And similarly for a guy like Brian Little, who was so impactful for this franchise. To steal a wrestling term, I can't wait to hear the pop that Brian Little gets mm -hmm. because he was beloved here. And I mean, and, and I think to some extent, sorry, as he also underappreciated for for how if, um, impactful he was. I would agree with that. You mean the fact that they tried replacing him as line A center for like three years? <laughs> well, you know, he's the kind of guy who was never flashy. I mean, nobody ever, you know, nobody ever talked about Brian Little in hushed tones for how he was as a player. But all he ever did was perform effectively when he was on the ice. Just a tremendously underrated, you know, undersized kind of guy who was never going to get the headlines. He was never going to be the star of the show, but he's the kind of guy that every single team needs. And the kind of guy who would have been appreciated, I think, in 31 other locker rooms more than necessarily by 31 other markets, if you want to get the difference there, that the players around the league knew how good he was, even if other fan bases, even the fan base in Winnipeg at times, didn't really recognize just how impactful and how effective he was in his roles for the Winnipeg Jets. You're right, Drew. And I think part of it was that, you know, he was like a 45, 55 point guy. Like, I think he scored 20 goals six times. Like, I was just looking at his stats here on Hockey DB. Like, you know, all 843 games, 217 goals, 304 assists for 521 points. But his career was cut short, mm -hmm. right? So, like, if you, if, if he wasn't injured all those years, he's most likely finishing his career with, 300 plus goals and well over 600 points probably closer to 700 points right so like that is a really solid nhl career it's not going to get you in the hall of fame nobody's right. saying that but i think it's also because the way he conducted himself like brian little was just that quiet leader and you and it's always like you know they say like you you see the the you know what how what a person's really like or i'm getting i'm butchering this but you know, uh, a person is really who they, who their friends are and who they surround themselves with. Obviously speaking very highly of you boys, right? But like, <laughs> I was going to gonna me, say, that says not, doesn't say anything great about yourself there. Well, no, and what I'm trying to say is Brian Little, just listen to the way other people talk about him, like other players talk mm -hmm. about him. And that really shows you how 
well-respected he was. And yeah, he was a good, talented center for the Thrashers and the Jets. And it's unfortunate that his career was cut short. But to me, it's just, he's a class act. That's what stands out to me about Brian Little. Like, nobody, you're not going to, nobody's going to say anything bad about him. He, he just went about his business. Uh, he wasn't a flashy guy, as you said, Drew, and he just had an excellent career. So like I said, I can't wait to hear the pop. I think there's, I think a lot of people are going to have goosebumps when Brian Little is honored tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, I think that's uh, very, very likely going to be the case. He's going to get a well-deserved uh, well, you know, acknowledgement from the people in Winnipeg and from the organization that clearly the organization still holds him in very high regard. Dave. Oh, and just well, one I, second, guys. Sorry, I got I got a text back from Murat. Uh, Murat is currently house sitting and uh, the puppy had an accident. So he so after he cleans up the puppy's Did accident. Did Murat have an accident and he's blaming it on the puppy? Is that kind of what we're getting here, Desi? Because that's what I'm thinking. Look, I spent $700 on dealing with my dog uh, this week, dealing with uh, some unfortunate Whoa. health conditions. $700? Somebody's doing well. Yeah. Well, I mean, no, Not anymore. Yeah. I, I was before the $700. So uh, I understand nobody... uh, puppy-related uh, delays uh, completely. Puppy related, you know, puppy. I know, but dog related oh, okay. delays is what I, I was like. I was Brixton like, I was like, 17 Brixton, yet? Brixton, I was say Brixton, at Brixton's this point, Brixton's be at 16. an octogenarian. Brixton is a, certainly a senior dog, she's 16. Yeah, 16. Yeah, good call exactly by me. Right. Yeah. Anyways, the, the one Br- thing Brixton's I want, immortal, right? Drew, the, the re, one <laughs> thing I, I, want, I hope, <laughs> yeah, the one thing I want to point out because I think it, you know, we're seeing in the chat, it is amazing to think that Brian Little's last game was what November 6th, November 9th, 2019. Yeah. And what's amazing to me is that since that time, even before that time, but since that time, all this organization has done is look for a second line center to replace Brian Little, whether it was externally, whether it was internally. And in all these years later, it's amazing to me that they still haven't done that. Now, of course, they're hoping like said, Dave, they could use Brian Little right now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's could, you're right. I mean, again, that's my whole point is that you had a guy who was that impactful and still is because they still haven't found his replacement. And, and they'll he, look and they're hoping with Lambert or or Jaeger or Jaeger, sorry, that they might have it in the future. But for right now, they don't they still don't have it. Well, here's who we have is we have Murata Tesh of The Athletic. Uh, good morning. I have a dog. I understand the predicament you were likely just in. How is the dog first and foremost? I mean, the dog is uh, is great. She's uh, she's I don't know six months old, puppy staged. We're looking after her, but uh, you know this house is new to her. You know all the smells are new. Uh, you know some of the toys are the same, all that. But like you know, she's, she's going through it, I think in a new environment and, uh, you know, we've all been there, I suppose, and we're, we're doing the best we can. Murat, just do what I do with Ezzy, put some patent the newspaper down, or if he gets really bad, I just put him outside. Yeah. Exactly. Just so you know. Yeah. 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 And Murat, as long as the puppy's staying away from the phone and the laptop and, and your well, how are the shoes the... is what I was going to ask. Yeah. <laughs> we have, we have a few shoes in a few places. Yeah. I can confess to that. Um, there's a, uh... Oh, <laughs> just over my shoulder. I don't know if you can see, but uh, she just brought a shoe to her bed. We She's like not the shoeing on it, but it's just there with her now. At okay, we got a point the in the now. interview. The audience wants to see the puppy. So, you know, <laughs> well, forget about the audience. Wrap, I want to see the puppy, for God's yeah, sakes. Exactly. Before we wrap, we want to see the puppy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's just Murat's fictitious puppy until then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he, he slept in. I mean, I have a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like the great kazoo from the Flintstones <laughs> doesn't actually exist. Only Murat can see it. Uh, Murat, let's talk about the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, Is the puppy in the room with you right now? Sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, a, a 4 0 start, uh, you know, a complete annihilation of a bad team last night in the San Jose Sharks. You know, all cylinders firing, you know, especially after last night when they get the Nemesnikov Ehlers uh, and, uh, and Perfetti line going. Let me just ask you this. You know, we've been very sunshine and rainbows to start. If you had to pull the brakes a little bit, what area are you pulling the brakes on? Yeah, you know, there there's room to believe there's some amount of reason to pull the brakes. There's some amount of paper tiger going on, um, especially with Pittsburgh in town on, on Sunday, too. There's a chance that this team goes 5-0 and to start the year without really beating a good team at 5-on-5. Five five. Right. Like um, the San Jose Sharks, credit to them, they're rebuilding and some of their top young guns weren't in the lineup yesterday. 
Winnipeg did exactly what Winnipeg should do. And I know we're not supposed to talk like that in the NHL. There's no easy games. There's no all that. But we've seen we, – and we've seen it. The Jets have struggled in games like that before. The Sharks were a tough out for them last year, in the last mm-hmm. few years even. So good on them for doing what they needed to do. I'm not going to plan a parade around that 8-3 game. Um, similarly, the Minnesota and Chicago games, they needed to fight tooth and nail to get to overtime and then win those games at 3-on-3. Three three. Uh, and then that first game against Edmonton where it was special teams heavy and the Oilers, I mean, got a couple of good shifts from Connor McDavid but were otherwise not there. And you can see it in their record and their struggles to get going. They're not there. So, I mean... I would never really dig into too much critique of a 4 0 start, but it's also not a situation where they've run right into the top teams playing at their best. And there could be some reason to press the caution button at the very least. And Murat, I think, you know, you would agree that even though it was against the San Jose Sharks, I mean, you'd love to see the Nemesnikov line break out because that was obviously a big topic of conversation. You were talking about that line with with Huss and Remus on Winnipeg Sports Talk, we talked about it on the post game shows or on the on the Saturday show. So yeah, you take it with a, a bit of a grain of salt because against it's against the Sharks. But we could have also on the flip side been talking about how that line had another poor game against an inferior opponent, right? And I specifically looked at at Ehlers, and and to me that was just quintessential Ehlers, right? On the power play and at even strength. And I think that's a good sign, especially when you're going into, you know, some tougher games. Say whatever you want about Pittsburgh, but Pittsburgh can score goals, right? So what were your kind of overall takeaways from the Nemesnikov line, who obviously, I mean, you, all you have to do is look at the box score to see how well they played. Yeah, yeah and I shouldn't have thrown Pittsburgh in with that same group, to be honest, uh, earlier a, a moment ago. Um, in terms of, oh. Oh, oh my boy. gosh. That, that is not a goes. small puppy. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> is that a great game? Uh, no, I don't know her breed. I don't know breeds. Is that a Weimar? So, uh, no, it's a German short haired German short haired pointer. I think, if I oh, had to guess, I was expecting like a cute little pup. Like that so is a that's a horse. <laughs> a cute dog. <laughs> yeah, she's like I don't know if she's six or seven months at this stage. Like she's, she's not growing a baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is that dog's name Clifford? Stacey, <laughs> by the way, Stacy's in agreement. It is. She thinks also it's a German short-haired pointer. So, uh, kudos to me. All right. Yeah. yeah here we go. <laughs> um, you where, walk the dog, oh, or the dog the walk you. The the Profetti Nemestikov Ehlers line, right? Is that the? Yeah. 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 So for me, the the issues that they had in the first few games were sort of getting up the ice with the same plan. Um, you had some moments of Ehlers trying to trying to go globe trotters, and it just didn't work. You had Cole Perfetti holding on to pucks until the play was dead, and, and it just the timing wasn't there, and Amestikov wasn't there yet either. Um, yesterday, I mean, let's start with the defensive zone, where before that first goal that that um, that Josh Morrissey scored with that line on the ice. It was Cole Perfetti making it back to his crease and breaking up a goal mouth play. So there's not even a shot attempt, despite the Sharks looking back door. Um, so that leads to the first goal that that line gets. It's Morrissey's goal. Uh, later, you have Ehlers scoring on the rush. His even strength goal was a Cole Perfetti backtrack to the blue line. Neil Pionk had gapped really aggressively at the Jets blue line because he saw the back pressure coming. Giveaway from the Sharks, takeaway by the Jets, and now Ehlers is going the other way. It's... It's encouraging because they did it in the right way, I guess, is, is why I'm, I'm leaning on the defense into offense sort of angle. Um, it's, you know, I, I really don't hold last night's Sharks team in, in high esteem, but who cares? The Jets played the way they needed to play. They didn't right. get into bad habits. And that line in particular turned defense into offense, got up the ice, had a plan, found each other, got the timing right, and, and, and really it paid off for them. Well, it's... Uh... You know, three questions in, and we have to talk about the man of the hour yesterday was Connor Hellebuck. You know, the William Jennings, the the um, Vesna trophy were were being shared with the crowd. It was a it was a day and a night. His dad Chuck, the you know international celebrity, was was in the crowd, but it was about a celebration of him. And I thought, you know, isn't that appropriate given the article that you wrote with Jesse Granger, I believe from the Athletic Vegas, why Jets Connor Hellebuck is the most underappreciated goalie of his generation. So why not share with the audience why he is, in fact, that? Yeah, it's a it's a bold title, um, mm-hmm. and 
I think the claim really is is when you look at these, you know, these other great goalies lists, like, you know, at the end of last season when you had these all-stars, these Hall of Fame goalies saying, who are the best goaltenders in the NHL right now? And Connor Hellebuck isn't even on that list in some mm-hmm. guys' cases. Or to start this season, the various rankings that you see and um, at other sites. I think Dom's models really uh, really believes that Connor Hellebuck is the Jets sometimes a little bit too heavy in that regard. But you look around the league at other other places, you see situations where they don't seem to think he's even amongst the best few goalies, even after winning that second Vezina trophy. And it just seems to me that Connor Hellebuck gets robbed of league-wide acclaim for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that the Jets haven't gone deep in a while and that he would be a part of for sure. The other is a commitment to it. <laughs> See, Poco is also, uh, you know, concerned that Hellebuck's not getting enough. Like, Criminally <laughs> underappreciated. Um, but his big and boring style keeps him off of some of the highlight reels, right? Like every once in a while, he'll stun us all with a paddle save or there's something particularly acrobatic. But I think that some of the other goalies of the generation end up on highlight reels because they end up out of position. It's not that they're compact and just they've made the perfect read. It's that they've had to scramble to make some of the same saves. And that, I think, costs perception. Playing out of Winnipeg can hurt you too sometimes, I think, in the league-wide, uh, in the in terms of getting league-wide love. But even then, the overall respect that Connor Hellebuck gets is high, right? He's got a good contract, like, a you know, He's, he's making eight plus million a year. He's got the two Vesnas. I think the world knows he's good. Um, I just think that if you look at the body of work and the consistency and the year in and the year out, the amount of goals he steals from other teams, uh, the amount of times he's been the absolute backbone of the Winnipeg Jets, we've underestimated how great he is. And like this is a player that, should there be a Stanley Cup in his future, would be an automatic Hall of Famer. Um, and it's some, sometimes stunning to me that there's even a, a debate around that. Yeah, Murat, before, a- before, sorry, before Drew, you get in here, I was just going to say, like, to your point, and I have no problem, you know, saying this because obviously I'm not going to make a, a bold proclamation here, but I mean, I think it's, it's, I think what you're trying to say, Murat, if I know what I'm trying to say, is that <laughs> you're, you're trying to say, like, we should not be taking this for granted here. Like we know that he's great and excellent, right? With the Vesnas and everything like that, the Jennings. But you're, you're you're trying to say that it's almost like sometimes it's like, yeah, he's great, but he's actually <laughs> elite. The definition of elite. And I think, like, I was I've had this conversation with Dave. Dave can back me up. Like, and and this is a bold proclamation, but I think he's almost already in the top ten goalies of all time conversation. I'd love that's, to. That's see. bold. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you have to go through it. There's like there, there's the untouchables, you know, the the Hashiks. Sure. First, Hashik for me is number one. Um, I know <coughs> Marty Broder on a, on a lot of those <laughs> too. Yeah, I think Hashik was just more of a freak and more of a of a guy who carried the entirety of his team. Uh, but he's the guy. Broder's got the cups, right? Yeah. And like the legacy comes in. For better or for worse, you know, you can you can be great for an extended period of time. You got to win the championship in this in the culture that we have in NHL discussion, even as the league grows, even as it gets harder, as as parity builds and you're not just sending a goalie to a stack team or what have you. You have to win those. And I think it's part of what's hurting Hellebuck's uh, reputation now. Not that people don't think he's good, but like you said, like appreciate greatness. Um yeah, and it, it really is sort of me. Part part of me now. I just <laughs> Haley's got the dog outside right now. I, I really apologize to you guys. I've had a mind in two places. Don't need You're to fine. apologize. We love dogs. When it's, <laughs> when it's dog if you related, have any when, other when animals, Marat, bring them out. When it's dog related, this show always gives a little bit of grace. <sighs> right on. Um, I just think that it's it as it is to your point with me and 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 my thoughts on Hellebuck is. Like, I think everybody knows they've got a good one. And I think that the idea that, like, th- it's it's almost tough for the market, tough for the out-of-market to, to wear it unless there's a, a series of deep playoff runs that they don't just have a good one. They have maybe the best goalie of the present moment in any given season and one of the best goalies of his generation, uh, without a doubt, and maybe yeah. even your point as well. 
Saturday morning, you're watching the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk, Ezra Ginsberg. The show's presented by our friends at Play Now. Our guest is Murat Atesh of The Athletic. Murat, a lot of attention to start the year on that Jets' second pairing. How is Dylan Samberg going to acquit himself moving up, playing in an elevated role? How is Neil Pionk going to handle... Uh, you know, is he going to be able to bounce back from a number of down years? Small sample size, with that being the caveat, but good results so far from both of them. What are you seeing from the Jets' second pair of Samberg and Pionk so far? Yeah, I'm seeing progress in kind of the areas that you would want to see progress. Neil Pionk can be a good top four defenseman when he's mobile, when he's aggressive at the Jets' blue line when he's using lateral movement to, to stay aggressive and cut plays off before it turns into long extended zone time, that takes reads. And he has those. Um, it also takes the movement. Like I, like I've been harping on, there've been some times in the last couple of years where you just watch him give up the line. We know that, you know, he finally confessed, uh, you know, the ankle injury that he had two years ago. Um, there, there were some issues as well. Like, and when he's not moving like he can, and when he's not, stepping up on plays and making those reads and having that confidence that comes with success in that role. Well, then he gives up the line and he's not one of the best at, at, at shutting down that long end zone play. If he can get out of that situation, which he has so far, he'll have success. And that's been a, even that goal that we just talked about where he gaps up aggressively, Perfetti takes the puck, either scores the goal. I mean, that's defense into offense and it's Neil Pionk doing exactly what he can be good at. And once upon a time was very good at in the NHL. Uh, for a couple of years there. For me, Dylan Sandberg, here's a player I really believe in stepping into a top four role. Uh, the defensive reads are there. The physicality is there. He's not a player who gets beat back door in, in his own zone because he failed to scan. He's a good scanner. He sees what's going on. Um, he breaks up plays as well. For me, my, my question marks for Sandberg heading into the year were, what's he going to do with the puck on a stick leading into a breakout? Like once he stops the play, What's the next play? Is he going to see that breakout pass? Is he going to execute it? If he executes it, is he going to jump into the rush like they're supposed to do? And I think that stepping into this bigger role, I was talking to Sandberg about this at camp, that like chaining reads together and seeing almost making it automatic instead of making the play, looking up, okay, catch my breath. Here's what I got to do. Um, is this is the next step for him? And I think so far early returns are good. I, I, I really believe in that defenseman. Yeah, I mean, we all remember that that goal against Edmonton, right? That was a, a beautiful shot. And that kind of, if we're talking about just that one play, right, that answered some of your questions about, you know, him jumping up into the play and adding more of a little bit of an offensive element, even though nobody's expecting him to put up, you know, 50 points a season. It would be nice, obviously. But, uh, Murad, I wanted to ask you about Brian Little, because obviously, you know, he's going to be, Hellebuck had his night and it's going to be Brian Little, sorry, Brian Little afternoon, not Brian Little night and we were talking about him a uh, little that is a little bit uh, before you came on what what stands out to you because obviously you know Brian Little's career like you forget he's only 36 years old if he didn't suffer that injury he might still be playing right and we even joked the Jets probably wouldn't mind having him up the middle on that second line with Perfetti and Ehlers and then maybe that drops Nemesnikov down to the fourth line but what what stands out to you about Brian Little who obviously you know we're talking about Hellebuck being a future Hall of Famer obviously nobody's going to call Brian Little a Hall of Famer but he had a really solid career in his time with Winnipeg. Yeah. Before I show up on the scene working for the athletic, there's a lot of years of lad little and Wheeler as just one of the, <laughs> I want to say most underrated uh, lines in the NHL for a long stretch. It was one of those situations where they dominated at five on five. They absolutely did. And if you care about five on five play and the metrics and things like that, you know, sometimes the numbers at the end of the season weren't uh, weren't like a point per game or anything to that effect. But they hemmed teams in their in in their zone at five on five. All three of those players were great. And little as sort of as as sort of the I mean the centerpiece is the word that comes to mind. But of course he's the center, and that um, made so much sense to me. Such skill, such finishing ability, such intelligence. Um, that sort of linked everything together. And he always found a way to get to soft ice in the middle of the ice and get to the net and score goals. Um, that was a lot that I, I admired kind of before getting into the room and then meeting him and interacting with him. And then just in interactions in the Jets dressing room, 
I found him to be so level headed. I thought he was so thoughtful. Um, he would call things like they were without it feeling like he was ever getting too high or too low. Um, I, I remember one time I was having a semi serious conversation with Blake Wheeler where uh, it was a playoff. I think it was before the Nashville playoff series because the Jets had just beaten Minnesota in five games. And Did anyone had... ever have any casual conversations with Blake Wheeler? <laughs> <laughs> and I just said what would have been the wrong thing to say to a Blake Wheeler at a time like that. It was something to the effect of, isn't it nice to just have a few days where you can sort of dial it back a bit and not be at 110% all the time? Because they were waiting at that time. And Blake Wheeler fixes me with that glare that <laughs> is like, okay, you idiot. <laughs> and then over his shoulder, because they were sitting beside each other at the ice plex, Brian Little just starts laughing. And it completely diffuses the thing. He like looks at me, he looks at Blake, he looks at me. And it just like completely made it a calmer, like, okay, we're all laughing now. Um, I remember after 2019 when the Blues series was over and the Jets got beat, everybody was a bit angry and shell-shocked and they didn't know what to say in the room. But he found words to describe that playoff series. And he, he was very good in that playoff series too. Even in game five, he was one of the guys that was really – or game six, it was a, a game six exit against yeah. St. Louis. Yeah, yeah it was um, six he, games, yeah. He was one of the guys that was pushing in the third and generating offense and 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 making things happen. And he would have been as shell shocked as the rest of them, I imagine. But just his calm articulation and making sure that everybody in the room had what they needed. I just, I, I've I've seen so many little stories or little moments where Brian Little has done the right, good human thing, um, and none of them have been headline worthy, but all of them have been positive. And that's my lasting takeaway. He didn't tell Paul Friesen to go F himself at any point in time like somebody else in the, in the Jets dressing room with that, uh, after that St. Louis game did. Yeah, exact same uh, same game, same night. Exactly right. The 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 fuck off freeze. Sorry, guys. The, yeah, the you F can off say it on, Don't worry. No, we're not on radio it. anymore. You can say the F word. <laughs> you know, we, Poco's just a puppy. I don't want her to hear yeah, anything. Don't, 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 don't burn the ears there. Yeah. Okay, you're a vibes guy. We know you're a vibes guy. So there's probably no bigger vibes guy in the Jets dressing room than Eric Comrie. I mean, he's just a guy that when you're talking to Mark Shifley, who sometimes is a little bit, you know, a tough nut to crack, get a smile out of. I mentioned Eric Comrie when we were doing, I think this was in the captain skates before the season even got underway. And the smile was ear to ear. You know, we know how Josh Morrissey feels about him. How much do you think, that impacted. I know you wrote an article about Eric Comrie, about how he came back to Winnipeg, how he won the job. But from from your perspective, when you saw Capo Kakin and, and Eric Comrie, to me, especially the way things looked like they were setting up, I, a lot of people were kind of caught off guard. But when he was playing the when he was backing up the last two preseason games, and then when he backed up in Edmonton, he thought, "Well, this seems this seems like they're going with Comrie over Kakin." How much do you think? How much at ease? How much his his good relationship, having come up the system with so many of these guys, including Connor Hellebuck, played a role, and also the fact that he, they think he can get back to what he did with them many years ago. Yeah, you know, I'm with you in that. The I I had it in my mind as Capo Kakinen was gonna what was gonna take that job. I thought that based on NHL numbers to date, based on certain things that Kakinen had the advantage there, and then. Right before he backed up uh, backed up Hellebuck in those last two preseason games, there was a practice at a Hockey for All where I was hanging out with North End Rick. I don't know if he's a regular on the show, but Twitter person. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we know Rick really well. Yeah. And uh, he was pointing out, he's like, oh, man, you know what? Catherine's kind of getting beat today. Like, he was just not having a day. And I was like, oh, you know what? Like, let's take a moment and think this through. And then, then, then Comrie gets the, the backup gig for those and for Edmonton. And it's, okay, well, here we go. Maybe there's something here. And even even until the moment Kakinen was waived, it seemed to me like it was it was hard to be sure what was going to happen. And then Comrie emerges, and, and credit to him for that. Um, I think Comrie's bet on himself is that he's got some good health uh, this year. Uh, we In the piece that you're talking about, we talked a little bit, just a little bit about some training tweaks he made to sort of activate his core and um, a, a little bit more. He described being less hingy in the net. But really what it comes down to is it's a place and a context where he's had some of his biggest success 
where some of his best friends play, Josh Morrissey being a good example, Mark Shifley being a good example. He officiated Eric Comrie's wedding because they were so close. They're just hanging out one day. The idea came up. Um, that's there. The good relationship with Connor Hellebuck, with Wade Flaherty. Um, you know, there's there's so much there. And then talking to Comrie for that for that interview, you say I'm a vibes guy and like sometimes I'm just a robot and I don't see feelings at all. In that conversation, <laughs> I was completely dialed into to feelings. And Comrie to me strikes me as a guy who who really leans in to things like comfort and relationships and yep. feeling at ease with the team and the and the roster and things like that. If I had to guess based on disposition and based on some of the things that we were talking about, who would have a harder time in a three goalie rotating situation in Buffalo coming up, coming down, getting hurt and what have you, and who would have a more successful time in Winnipeg where he knows everybody so well, Eric Comrie and the way that he talks about the guys and the way that he interacts seems like exactly the candidate to do better in this city and with the relationships that he has here. Which which game is going to be Comrie's first game of the season? I mean, you look at the schedule. There's no back to backs. It's every second night. Which one do you think he gets? Could be you think he gets one. You think he gets one of the three on the uh, on the road trip, this upcoming road trip? Yeah, you know, before it all started, I thought that, or I guess the moment I learned that Connor Hellebuck night was Friday, I thought Hellebuck would get the first four, and I I had tomorrow earmarked as the Eric Comrie game. Now, I know Hellebuck is famed for loving the afternoon, right? Like, this is a mm. thing about him. No morning skate, just get there, do the job. Like, um, so there's there's a Despite reason. Despite the fact his numbers aren't that good in the afternoon. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, there's you a bit of a fallacy info? about that. Okay, so that's an interesting one. And and maybe, I, I don't really think that giving up three goals is in that Sharks game is a catastrophe. But if you really wanted to twist your brain and say, well, hey, he finally um, was human for a night. Maybe it's time to give him a break. This, this could point to an Eric Comrie start tomorrow. Um, all that said, Pittsburgh is scoring a ton. Um, Malkin and, and Crosby are, are hot to start the season. There's a lot going on there. Maybe you do go back to your guy and it's not till the road. Um, so the, the answer is I don't know. Before this, I would have thought tomorrow would have been Comrie with, with the idea that the afternoon, I don't know, Hellebuck might strong arm his way into it. <laughs> no, Ron, sorry, for you. Sorry, sorry, I was just going to, before you get your last question in, how funny is it? I don't know if you've been following, Kakinen's been having uh, visa issues. Like, how funny is it that Colorado would probably actually have started him recently if he wasn't having these visa issues with the way Gorgiev and and Annan has struggled right it's pretty pretty crazy how that's developed that who we thought was going to be the Jets backup is now a, the goaltender that Colorado desperately wants to get in into their net right yeah and especially after the playoffs where Colorado's goaltending was supposed to be the weakness it's like hey wait there it is there it is <laughs> Yeah, it was the weakness in every other series uh, after the Jets won, unfortunately for Jets fans. Okay, last one for you, Murat, and I'll we'll let you get back onto puppy duty. Uh, you know, early in the year, coaches never want players to sit. They never want the 13th forward to be sitting for weeks at a time. They never want the seventh defenseman to be sitting for weeks at a time. Given how strong the fourth line for the Jets has been and given how solid the six defensemen have been for the Jets – do you, where do you see an opportunity for David Gustafson or now that he's healthy for a Logan Stanley to get back into this lineup? Yeah, it can, as far as I'm concerned, it could be literally any game that, that the coach decides. Like, I think there are enough structural things going well for the Winnipeg Jets that their, their success does not depend on rolling the identical winning lineup. Their success, despite like, Let's give Hayden Fleury his his credit. Let's give Rasmus Kupari credit too. I mean, mm -hmm. Kupari heading into the season, I, I thought of him as the guy that's always in the picture and never doing anything because his reads were a step behind his feet. Well, he's processing the game a little bit quicker now, and he's making things happen. He's generating scoring chances. Um, there's there's a little bit more there this year, and let's let's give credit there. At the same time, I don't think Winnipeg's early season success hinges so strongly on those guys that you couldn't rotate in Gustafson tomorrow and hey, things would be just fine. Um, Logan Stanley, it seemed like Arneal wanted to see how he responded to some of these skates a little bit and some of these practices before declaring him 100% fit to go. But even then, um, you know, it, once he does feel like he's ready to go, I think Fleury's played 
pretty darn well. And also, I think you could give Stanley that. Because the thing you don't want is it to suddenly be the middle of November and they're playing in the, you know, the middle of this stretch where they've been playing every other night forever. And now somebody's dinged up and now you're throwing an ice cold Logan Stanley, or even by then Billy Hanela into, into the mix. Like they're going to need these guys. And I think that they're good and they're, they're well enough off that they could throw them in whenever they feel. Murata Tesh covers the Winnipeg Jets for the athletic. He's also an expert uh, dog sitter and dog walker. So we'll let you get on to that. Hopefully we'll see you around the neighborhood with the pup. We can uh, I'll introduce yeah. uh, your and puppy to my, to my, uh, yeah, to my uh, <laughs> get, 16 year old puppy. Get Poco some food because that dog needs, needs to be fed. If it's going to keep growing to, Maybe, to its yeah. uh, full size. She'll be a, a six foot wolf by the next time we do. <laughs> this show. Thanks for having me guys. And thanks for bearing with. Thanks, yeah. Murata. Have, Cheers, a great, Murata. Uh, have a great rest of your Saturday. We'll see you again soon. There he goes. Murata Tesh joining us this morning. Always that was a great big to... dog. What did you say that was? A German pointer? A German or short haired pointer. German short-haared pointer. They're beautiful they're nice, dogs. They're really nice dogs, actually. Yeah, they are. I have a Dave, friend who's Dave's uh, always a been a, a huge dog lover. Ever since I've known dog uh, Dave, he's always known a lot about dogs and always been very good with a lot of dogs dave so. is willing and, and happy to actually walk other people's dogs yes that's what i'm saying yeah but he doesn't have his own dog so explain yourself manuk oh, oh. <laughs> my there's no explanation i just unfortunately that was I, uh that was reuben and gabby the babysitter okay uh, well uh, is gabby walking reuben is that what's happening right now or reuben's walking gabby i'm pretty sure it's the other way around but uh no i mean look i've been a dog uncle for most of my life because uh you know a little bit busy but uh you know, German Shepherd, Golden Retriever, two of my favorites, and usually have those to, to take for a that's while. That's mine. So. If I if I ever get a dog for my kids, and I, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, that's what I would go with, a Golden Retriever. Well, it's uh, can't go wrong with the with a beauty. Any dog is a beautiful dog, but uh, I'm always of the uh, policy to adopt, not shop. Uh, you know, that's where we got our. Yeah, we don't got judge Mendel. I'm going to judge a little bit. There's so many dogs. The Humane Society is overflowing. The Winnipeg Animal Services. Where'd you get Brixton from? We got her from the Humane Society. I know, you think that kidding. Brixton's a designer dog? I love my dog, but she ain't no designer well, dog. Is probably you. Have, your, have your dog spayed or neutered. There you go. Thanks, Bob Thank Barker. you, uh, Bob Barker. Yeah. When we come back, more on the Jets and the Neil's Penguins. my dog. It's Craig, your boy, Bruce, a.k.a. Craig Neil. Button. He's my dog. Would you shut up? Craig Button at the bottom <laughs> of the hour as well. Saturday woof, morning, woof. the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manouk, Ezra Ooh. Ginsburg, where the show rolls on. Ooh. We want to thank you for not betting with Play Now and choosing our Because we couldn't afford things like this. Without your money. So much of your money. Now you might have questions like... Do our profits benefit your community? <laughs> no. Or bet with Play Now, Manitoba's local legal and secure gambling site. Dining, entertainment, parking, and convenience. All in one spot. City Place is located in the heart of downtown Winnipeg, attached to the Canada Life Center. Whether you're working, living, or out for a night in the downtown, make City Place your go-to destination before or after the fun finds you. Lunchtime, game time, anytime, visit City Place at 333 St. Mary Avenue, next to Canada Life Center. Holt Dental, the new official dentist of Illegal Curve, has a philosophy rooted in two unyielding principles, genuinely caring about patients and providing outstanding service. Being a patient of Holt Dental means more than just checkups and treatments. It's taking the time to listen and talk to each patient so they can achieve the best long-term health, functionality, and aesthetics for their teeth, mouth, and gums. Conveniently located at Grant Park Festival on Taylor Avenue, Holt Dental is dentistry of the highest quality in a comfortable and relaxed environment. For more information, visit holtdental.ca. Oh, and there's plenty of free parking at the front door, too. Celebrating its 40th year as Winnipeg's home for stand-up comedy, Rumors Restaurant and Comedy Club has recently been named Canada's Top Comedy Club and a Top 5 Comedy Club in North America. From birthday parties to date nights to fundraisers and everything in between, Rumors is your destination for the best and most affordable 
live entertainment Winnipeg has to offer. For more information on upcoming shows, rumors and credible promotions, and to purchase tickets, visit rumorscomedyclub.com. So you're a pizza person, you married a wing person, but somehow your kids are salad people. You can't pick your fam, but you can pick your BP meal deal. Starting from $18.99 for takeout or delivery at bostonpizza.com. Quarter after the hour, welcome back to the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsberg with you. Craig Button set to join us at the bottom of the hour. Always great to catch up with Craig. Uh, he was on the broadcast with Sarah last night, so I'm sure he'll have some insights and analysis regarding the Winnipeg Jets. Tomorrow, the Pittsburgh Penguins come to town. Uh, as we've sort of talked about briefly on the show so far, a Penguins team that can certainly uh, you know, put the puck in the net with Crosby and Malkin, that shouldn't come as a surprise, but also a team that has had a lot of difficulty in keeping the puck out of their own net. And that's really uh, a game where the Jets should be able to, their their attention to detail has to be on point, especially in the defensive zone, because the Penguins play so loose otherwise that the Jets need to start on the defensive th- side of things, and then they should be able to generate opportunities against the Penguins team that's pretty loose. Yeah, it's it's not a very good defensive team. You're absolutely right, Drew, but it's all, all obviously not a pushover either. And guys, remember, Alex Nedeljkovic was the goaltender who led them and finished the season and got them into a Remember, They were very close to making the playoffs last year. It came down to, I think the last game or the last couple games, if you guys remember, of course you remember uh, who could forget nobody in the Eastern conference wanted to claim that last, that last (laughs) wild card spot, right? Like you had like Detroit in there, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and obviously Washington claimed it. And then uh, abruptly was swept right after that by the New York Rangers. Right. So the East is obviously uh, top heavy as we know, it's pretty middle heavy actually uh, as well. But, Um, I really wonder, you know, where does this Pittsburgh Penguins team go from here, right? Like, obviously, you know, they're off to an okay start three and three, but like this team has to win, but you wonder like, what's the best case scenario for this Penguins team to get into the playoffs in a wild card spot and then lose to like the Rangers or the Devils or another team, right? Like it's, it's a team to me that's just been going sideways forever. And like, I focus when I think about Pittsburgh, like, I, I think of just how much it's how much I'm going to love watching Crosby in these last two or three years, right? And that's that's what stands out to me. Like you have the Penguins coming into town. There's going to be lots of Crosby jerseys, um, and it's always just a treat for Jets fans to be able to watch him live. But yeah, I mean, look, they they can score goals, and and their power play is looking a little bit better than it was. I think it was last in the NHL or second last in the NHL last year. It was a big problem for them. And, you know, you're still have to, you're still going to have to know who's on the ice. And they have other players, too, like Ricard Raquel. He's off to a pretty good start as well. Um, so, you know, it's it's when, once you get into the kind of lower lines, um, you know, they bring in Cody Glass to hopefully resurrect his career. Obviously, Glass is from from Winnipeg. So it's uh, it's going to let's put it this way. It's going to be a lot more challenging of a game than it was against the Sharks. The The Penguins have a, a lot deeper of a team than the Sharks do. That's for well, sure. You know, this Penguins team, Dave, sort of reminds me of a Jets team of yore in that they're all gas, no breaks. Not a lot of defensive structure, not a lot of defensive uh, attention to detail so far. Uh, mm-hmm. They've given up 19 goals at five on five. So it's not like they're getting killed uh, you know, on the special teams or on the PK. It's all happening at five on five. So th- this reminds me of a Jets team of a few years Years ago, where it was just basically open season in terms of five on five play, loosey goosey, always focused on the offense, and we know that that's not necessarily a long term recipe for success. No, and I'm I'm with as like you you look at this team and you try and figure out what the the vision is because right. they've they've traded away so many prospects uh, in order to try and get better, in order to try and maximize Crosby and Malkin's, you know the kind of the end of their careers and hoping that they can kind of give them another shot, another Stanley cup chance. And so you, your farm system is nothing to write home about. And so that's a problem from the long-term perspective. And you don't really have the depth to challenge those other Eastern heavyweights right now. So the, the penguins to the point, as he just made are that kind of team that are going to hover. They're going to be in that, in that race with Sidney Crosby, 
I never ever discount that uh, any team with him on it because he's just so good, but there's only one, so much one man can do. So you look at that and you think, okay, this team will be, you know, probably in and amongst the teams fighting for the final, you know, couple of playoff spots in, in the Eastern conference, but really ultimately what is their likelihood of getting very far? And it's not, I just don't see it. I don't see the vision there. So I understand that, you know, they tried to get Eric Carlson to, to, you know, really, see if they could maximize, you know, knowing that that contract is already looking a little bit rough, going to be even rougher in a year or two, but, but knowing that, okay, maybe that is a spark for our offense. But the problem is, as you just touched on, Drew, this is, it's a lot of offense, yeah. not a lot of defense. And when the goal, when you don't have goaltending that you can kind of sit back and rest your, on your laurels, which for the record is what the Jets were able to do when they played that style because yeah. they had Connor Hellebuck. There's a lot more, you have a lot more latitude to, to make that sort of decision. Cause you're like, okay, well, if we blow it, which we probably will, he's going <laughs> to save our bacon, which right. I, you know, Josh Morrissey literally said that two days ago and they're not necessarily talking about the present day jets, but just that idea of having someone like that, the penguins do not have that. And because of that, it's hard to play that style because it opens you up to being a team that's let in, what did I say? 25 goals already on the season and second most in the NHL. So I just don't see it as a recipe for success, whether it's, you know, on a year basis or even on a long-term basis, because they don't seem to have the system in place to, you know, with the jets, the one thing about the jets, you'll say is that they've developed. Well, I know folks are going to say, Oh, well, look there, they've stagnated their, their prospects. But, but the point is that they always seem to have that crop. And then with the jets, it sometimes is that, you remember in 16, 17, after they made their playoff run, they kind of had to let their forwards grow in. They had their defense already structured. Mm. Now it feels like they've got some young forwards that they might have to let grow in, and they've already kind of got everything else solidified. But regardless of that, like I said, it just seems that this Penguins team seems to be a bit of a mishmash, Ezzy. Well, what no, I it's, like it's absolutely. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Drew. I was going to say would, it's absolutely a mishmash. Like, like again, I think you know, if you're a Jets fan, and obviously, you know, I imagine most of the people watching the show and listening to the podcast are just appreciate what we have today in in Crosby and Malkin because these guys are towards the end of their careers, right? And just appreciate what they're because the thing with Crosby and Malkin is it's not like these guys are mediocre players. Now Malkin is tied with Panarin for the league lead in points. And I realize some teams have played three games. Some teams have played six games, but 11 points in six games, like Malkin's playing fine. And that goes drew to Dave's point. Like there's only so much Crosby and Malkin and, and Latang and Carlson can do at this point in their careers. Like the supporting cast just isn't there. Like, you know, I mentioned Ricard Raquel. He's got three goals so far. Brian Rust. I've always liked him. He's a good player. But, like, then it just really thins out, and then you've got, like, a mishmash of, you know, guys like Lars Eller, Pooley RV on the third line with Kevin Drew O'Connor. Uh, old, old friend Kevin Hayes is in deck. Yeah, Kevin Hayes, like, league. you know, Cody Glass is centering that fourth line with Noel Achari. Like, it's just, it's not as deep, especially when you compare the Penguins to the Jets. They just don't have the same forward depth or defensive depth. Like, Carlson and Latang, they're going to get their points, especially, you know, when it comes to the power play. Like, they're still good defensemen. But at this point in their careers, and look, like, let's be honest here. Carlson's never been one of the best defensive defensemen. Mm-hmm. And, and the goaltending to me is like, we'll talk to Craig Button about it um, when it comes to uh, the Colorado Avalanche, because I want to get Craig's thoughts on the Avalanche, who obviously just got their first win. But this team to me, like I mentioned, Alex Nedeljkovic, who became their number one goalie last year, he's now on a conditioning snip. But they need him back desperately because the goaltending they're getting from Bloom, Bloomquist and, and Jari, it's just not cutting it. I look at last night's game between the Penguins and the Carolina Hurricanes as sort of a model that the Jets should try and emulate. You know, what do the Hurricanes and the Jets have in common? They have excellent structure, by and large, in common. So what do you need to do against a team like Pittsburgh, that team that's always going to be go, go, go? You need to have that structure because that's where they're going to fall apart. That's where Pittsburgh is going to have difficulty is playing against the team with structure because they don't know how to, uh, they just don't know how to necessarily counteract that. If the Jets keep their structure, then they should be in a good position against a team like Pittsburgh, even with the firepower that Crosby and Mall can bring to the table. That's why that to me is really a key for the Jets' success. It's a key for the Jets' success night in and night out, but particularly tomorrow. Pittsburgh wants teams to get into a track meet with them. They want to get into a race with other teams because that's how they can succeed. 
the Jets don't want to do that. They want to stay within their game. They want to make Pittsburgh try and play the Jets style of game because I don't think the, the Penguins can, which should lead to opportunities for the Winnipeg Jets, especially then against weak goaltending that the Penguins have had so far this year, Dave. Yeah, it's about being opportunistic, and it's about, again, what we've been talking about, which is imposing your will and your game plan on the opposition. And I think that that's a, this is probably the best example right now, Drew, of a team that is you're going to try and impose that will. And you have mm-hmm. last change, so you can get the matchups that you want, for the most part, obviously. And, and to me, that'll be a real sign is we'll see it early in the game. Don't get involved in that. Don't get involved in in that run gun. You have to get away. And look, it's fun. You know, players naturally want to play less structure and more free-flowing hockey. But I think the one thing the Jets team have seen is that they can win. They can have success playing this manner of hockey. They saw it last year. They're seeing it this year. Again, there's, 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 we're not saying the Jets are the perfect team. We're not saying that the Jets, you know, don't have, things that they need to work on and get better and improve on. Like, like I said, scoring at five on five, you know, uh, I've seen yesterday, although they had some power play success, obviously yesterday as well, but well, they had success all across the board yesterday against the sharks. But that's one of those things that you want to see from the jets is that you can continue to play the game that has brought you to a four, no start. Why would you get, why, would, you know, again, the, the saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But you right now are tweaking some of the things that you've seen through the first four games, right, Ezzy? But you're yep. still embracing it for the most part because it hasn't gotten you to the point where you have eight points out of eight points. I'm, I'm really curious to see if Comrie gets the start tomorrow afternoon. I, obviously, I don't think so. If, I if don't Hellebuck, think he does either. If Hellebuck gets the start tomorrow, nobody's going to surprise. I don't. I'm not. I didn't say that he yeah, is going to get curious. the start. I'm, yeah, just, yeah. I'm, I'm curious. just curious because Hellebuck started the first four games, and we know that starting with last night's game, the Jets have seven games in 13 days. So Comrie is going to get at least one start, if not a couple. I'm just curious to see because, you know, even though Hellebuck, I, I do, I'm leaning towards Hellebuck getting the start, but then you wonder when they go on the road trip, like this, what is it, St. Louis? I think Louis? Comrie gets the Seattle game. St. Louis is Tuesday. St. Louis yes. is Tuesday. I think Comrie gets the, uh, I think Comrie gets the Seattle game. That would I be, that if, I, if I had to ask uh, Wade Flaherty what the schedule is, because they have the schedule, they have that idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I would, I think it's probably Thursday against the oh, Boys, when is Eric Comrie night? That's when we'll know that he's playing, no, if it's Eric Eddie, Comrie night. His response to Drew would be like, how did you get in here? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you and why are you talking to me right now? Yeah, but I mean, we know Hellebuck likes to play a lot. I mean, it's funny because I don't think we're going to be having the conversation this year, guys. You know, how many games is Hellebuck going to play? 55 to 60. He's going to be right around 60. I think we all agree, barring any unforeseen injuries, right? So if Comrie doesn't get the start tomorrow afternoon, yeah, he's most likely going to get one of the starts in the first two games of that road trip. Yeah, I would think that would be the case. But I mean, I go back to, you know, the, the Jets... You know, I, I I have to believe, and I think they believe that they know that their their success, and it's been shown over the last year plus now, their success starts with their attention to detail. Look at the goals against San Jose last night. A number of them start with strong defensive play to then transition the puck up the ice. So that's why I think you're going to look for that same sort of style against the Pittsburgh Penguins tomorrow. Now the Penguins are a better team. Uh, again, than the San Jose Sharks. They're a better team record-wise. They're a better team on paper. They have more talent. So you can't compare apples to apples, but both teams don't have that. uh, They they don't have structure to their game. The Penguins are, like I said at the outset of this segment, all gas, no break. The Jets are going to need to try and slow the Penguins down, and then they should be able to take advantage of a weaker opponent. The Jets have more depth. They have better structure. They have a better approach to the game night in night out i would say than the penguins do or afternoon Peng- penguins afternoon win four two tomorrow <laughs> well i don't I, I don't see that i'll be honest no, i'm joking i'm Jets... joking no i mean the peng look the pe- it's it's kind of what we already talked about the penguins have a, a team that can score goals and they can they can hang in there but they're going to struggle against look we saw it last night against carolina what is carolina they're a well-structured defensive team right and and by the way great to see uh jackson blake uh, contributing for the the Hurricanes. For those who know, he was a Hobie Baker runner-up um, and played for the UND, J- uh, Jason Blake's kid. 
but I'm yeah. digressing here. You guys know Carolina is my pick to win the Stanley Cup. So well, anytime, anytime I have a chance to pump up the Hurricanes, I'm going to do that, right, Dave? Look at the Penguins. Look who they've played. They lose to the Rangers 6 nothing. One of the Rangers, they're a good structure team. They're a good team. They lose to the Hurricanes 4-1 last night. Same thing. They lose to the Leafs. You know, the Leafs are a good team, and, they're, and Craig Berube is trying to teach them how to play within that structure. They lose 4-2 sure. to the Leafs. Who have the Penguins beat? They beat the Red Wings. Well, the Red Wings are still not a very good hockey team. They beat the Canadians. Still not a very good hockey team, and they beat They're the playing Sabres. pretty well, though. Sam Montebo leads the league in goal save above expected. I know, but the but the, the Canadians are not what you would... Again, they're not a structured team. There's still a lot of uh, loosey-goosey uh, activity are making the to their play. Well, you know, I'm, my point is that you play structure against the Penguins, they tend to struggle, and that's why I think the Jets should have that focus tomorrow afternoon when they do battle in downtown Winnipeg. I don't think the Habs game. are making the playoffs. I'm just trying to get under your skin, Drew. I wasn't even listening to you. Penguins <laughs> uh, and post game after the Jets and the Penguins tomorrow, right around 4.30, 4.40 in that time frame. We'll talk about that. When we come back, Craig Button, TSN Director of Scouting. You know him from the Jets, all the Jets on TSN broadcast. He's going to Join us next to talk about the Jets and look around the NHL early on in this 24-25 season. It's the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. It's brought to you by our friends at Play Now. Don't go anywhere. Craig Button up next on this Saturday morning. The latter half of hour number two starts now on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Saturday morning, Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk, Ezra Ginsberg. The show is brought to you by our friends at Play Now. And we're pleased to welcome to the program... From TSN, he's our very good friend. Craig Button joins us on this Saturday morning. Craig, nice to see you. How are things? Things are <laughs> things are good, but things are great in Winnipeg. Four and zero, uh, and rolling right along. It's uh, it's pretty impressive to see how well they've played. I, I don't think we should be surprised, but nonetheless, uh, we, we should be impressed. Impressed is certainly a good way to be. 4-0 for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, a dream start, the first time in uh, 1.0 or 2.0 history that they've won their first four games of the season. Uh, Craig, you pay as much attention to the Jets as we do and uh, you know, all around the league. You know, When you watch the Jets right now, is this just a team that is sort of building upon the structure that was put in place and they believe that the, that it starts with defensive responsibility and then everything else stems from that. Yeah, I do believe that. And I mean, they gave up the least amount of goals last year in the NHL. So, you know, obviously you have Connor Hellebuck who, who, who's a big part of that, but you can't, you can, you have to play good team defense to have the lowest goals against in the league. And certainly the Jets are committed to that. Everybody's been committed to that. We saw it happen last year. We're seeing it happen this year. And, and yes, they blow out Edmonton 6 nothing. They win 8-3 last night versus uh, San Jose. But in the other two games where they only gave up one goal, tight games where they, they, they were in a game where they knew that they couldn't take an offensive risk. They, and, and they trusted themselves that we're going to keep playing, we're going to keep playing. Yeah, it took a little bit of time. Uh, you know, overtime to be ultimately get the the win. But when when you're committed and and you see the results, not that it's ever easy to uh, to to stay committed, but your belief in in what you have to do to be successful continues. And I, I think this team is 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 a very strong structured defensive team. And even, even the one goal, I, I believe it was Ehlers' goal, you, when. They're tracking back. They create the turnover and they're right back on the attack, you know, and, and even like pressure, where are you going to put pressure on in the neutral zone? Like you don't have to just skate back hard and then defend in your own zone. Defensively, the, I believe defensive play begins the minute you lose the puck. So the minute you lose the puck, you have to be committed now to making sure that you're working back to position, back to structure to get the puck back. And, that, that can be in the offensive zone, it can be in the neutral zone, it can be in the defensive zone. But that goal, and, and, and that's that to me is, is, is a good example of, of that defensive commitment. And the, the Winnipeg Jets, it, it's no accident that they had their goals against uh, uh, last year and, uh, that was the lowest in the NHL. It's no accident what they're doing this year with respect to the defensive play. Craig, it just seems like yesterday that we were talking about the Jets drafting Cole Perfetti, and obviously it's only one game, and sure, it's the Sharks, but I don't really care. I mean, yesterday was one of the best games that I've ever seen him play at the NHL level, right? Creating the turnover, scoring the two goals in the third period, and as you know, I mean, a lot of people 
Perfetti has been kind of a, a, a topic of discussion here because of, you know, let's be honest, he struggled a little bit in the second half of the season, but boy, was it nice to see him uh, put up four points yesterday uh, because that second line through the, f- the first three games was just okay. So we can go to okay and, and okay off offensively, but we're going to go back to defensively. Right. You know, they were, they were part of the defensive play and, and, and not, and, and, and again, they're a good example, Ezra, of, of, a, of, a t- of saying, okay, listen, we know we can score and, and we can get some points, but we're not going to chase it. And we're not going to hurt our team in our own chase sword. So I, I, I think we should uh, make sure that we give them some, some, uh, accolades for playing really good defensively. Cole Perfetti's 21 years old. He's 21 years old. <laughs> you know I mean, I, I know he's been around for, for what seems like a long time. He, he, he's a good young player. Our expectations seem to be that we, that we want something sooner rather than later. And players, as long as they're showing progression, and I thought Cole showed progression last year. To your point, Ezra, you know, I, I, I think he had some challenges in the second half of the season. But the, also what happened is, is they and, and then they acquired Toffoli, they acquired Monaghan. That, that pushed them into a different spot in the lineup and even out of the lineup at times. But he, he's a good young player that's 21 years old. And you you start to see where a player is going to, is going to fit. And I don't think there's any question that he's a second-line player. Now what he's got to do is just hold that spot. And last night, to your point, was a really good example of, of, of somebody getting in there and doing the things that, that you expect you, your team to do, your individual players to, and what the expectation of, it, uh, of him is with respect to his capabilities. And his capabilities are good. And last night, certainly, uh, it, 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 it's encouraging for everybody to see that. The most encouraging is for Cole Perfetti to do it. Right. <laughs> You know, Craig, one of the biggest question marks with Brendan Dillon moving on uh, during the offseason was, will Dylan Sandberg be able to fill those minutes, fill that role that Brendan Dillon has, you know, uh, executed so well the last few years? So far, he's up, you know, five minutes more playing time than he was at, I mean, again, early in the season, but he's up five minutes higher, about the 20 minute mark, just about above there. What are you seeing from Dylan Sandberg and how have you seen him so far take on that role that he's uh, been given? Did, did you happen to see the pregame last night, Dave? I did. The, and I talked specifically about I Dylan know, Sandberg. I know. Okay. I, want, I want the audience <laughs> to hear it, Craig. Just okay. Case. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. I did. Yeah, no, like, no. You know, yeah, no. I don't miss your stuff, Craig. I don't miss your stuff. Oh, okay. Well, thanks. <laughs> but, you know, uh, how wonderful is it to have Sarah back? Isn't it? Isn't it oh, wonderful yes, to have Sarah yes. back? I mean, Absolutely. She is, she is all kinds of awesome. Anyway, uh, so as I said last night, Dave, and, you know, Dylan has been a really good player, like obviously a second-round draft pick. He, he, he was wildly successful at UMD in college. The, the Winnipeg Jets bring him in. They, 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 they water him. They, they feed them, you know, and, and, and they grow, and, and they help them grow. They give them some sunlight, you know. They don't – and, and – the benefit for Dylan was is that he got to play behind Brendan Dylan, so he wasn't thrust into this position before he was ready to to handle it. And then he he gets to watch Brendan Dylan handle those minutes, handle those assignments, handle the responsibilities that go with being a second pair defenseman and, and having to play those significant minutes. And now, listen, Brendan Dylan is was fantastic in my view for the Winnipeg Jets in so many different ways. And, and then change happens. And, you know, Brendan ends up leaving free agency and, you know, good for him. But good for the Winnipeg Jets because what they were able to do is, is, is have Dylan grow, be mentored. And now when it became necessary for him to step into that role, he's ready. He, he's more than ready. And, and, and you, again, we talk about everybody wants to be somewhere yesterday. It, you know, when, I mean, that's just society. Mm-hmm. That's not just hockey. And, and, but, and I said this, the Winnipeg Jets, there, there's nobody that does it better than the Winnipeg Jets. Now, there's, there's some teams that do it as well. But in terms of their, de- their, their development model, nobody does it better than them. They, they put players in the positions where they can, where they can handle whatever that is. 
They help them grow. They help them develop. They're patient. They, they put good people and good players around them. And then now when it becomes necessary for Dylan Sandberg, in this case, to have to take a step forward, like it's like, okay, we'll just slide him right in there. And he, he's ready to do it. And, and, and so to me, it, it, it's, it, it, it didn't happen in the offseason. Like he, he's taken on the new role. This has been something that they've been building, like, you know, with, with all their players. And, and it's, it's so impressive. You know, one of the things that, that I've said many a times, NHL teams fail players more than players fail on their own. By putting them into positions that they're not ready for, by not supporting them around, not giving them support around them. And then, and then, and then oh, boy, he didn't make it. He didn't do it. He, you know, he's not this. He's not that. The Winnipeg Jets don't do that. And I know that at times younger players might feel a little bit, oh, geez, I want my chance. Give me my chance. I can't believe you're not giving my chance. What I would say is just trust the Winnipeg Jets. Just watch how they develop players and then set up players for success. And ultimately, you're going to get a lot of rewards. And, and, and I think that's critically important for young players to, uh, to, to recognize, and I think they do. And in this case, for Dylan Sandberg to be able to take on, I mean, that's an important role. And it's a significant area of the team. And, and Dylan's not going to shy away from any of the challenges. And I think he's fully ready to, to be a top four defender and do what D Brendan Dillon did for a lot of years. I think Jets fans might clip that uh, that that audio and video you just had and send it to Rutger McGrory, Craig, when with regard to the developmental process uh, here in Winnipeg. <laughs> so I got to say something. Yeah. So I honestly believe that the Pittsburgh Penguins sent Rutger McGrory down to the uh, minor leagues so he didn't have to come to Winnipeg, just to avoid the the yep. awkwardness I, or the situation yep. of it all. Awkwardness or whatnot, like. You know, like I know Rector, and I, I love Rector, and Rector's a, like a, a good and, and and he made a decision, but but I think that's why they sent him down, so he didn't have to come to Winnipeg. But whether he's I, I'm not going to I'm not going to disagree with you on that one, Craig. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. But what yeah. lesson is that? What lesson is that sending to to a young player, or is it just protecting it, him from 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 himself? Well, I mean, what I would say is, and and again, like you don't have to like what Rector for or what he did right but we we can respect it right and we can say okay listen do what's best for yourself and you know if you don't feel that the fit in winnipeg was right for you there's going to be people that don't like it and that just goes apart and part but when you make a decision like that then you have to be accountable for it and i and, and to me the, the, what, what i think is they're not helping rector mcgory be accountable they're not doing that <laughs> well similar to with uh, with cutter goche and the flyers last year right well, but 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 Cutter hasn't had, Cutter hasn't had come come back to Philadelphia yet, right? You know, mm -hmm. like you, they, you know, like I, I'm talking specifically about Rector. And there's other players. Adam Fox said he sure. didn't want to go some to, to Calgary. It's happened over time. We we see it, okay? There's, and again, we don't have to like it. We don't have to agree with it, but we can respect it. But when you make that, you got to be accountable. Well, so do and players? Like the Pittsburgh Penguins sending him down to Wilkes-Barre to avoid Winnipeg? Sorry, you're not helping them be accountable. Do, do you know when a player do players owe teams an explanation when they say they don't want to play in a certain market or they they you know they, they have the right to determine you know the path of their career? They can say, you know, we're not, I don't want to be there, please trade me. Do they owe teams an explanation beyond just the, the rote answer? I, I would hope. I would hope that a team gets an understanding of why a player may not want to play in that organization. I, I, I don't, I don't think it has to be public, but, but mm -hmm. I, but I believe that the, the team is owed that. I mean, let's just use Rutger for an example. They draft Rutger in the first round. They spend a lot of time with him in, in development for two summers. They're, you know, they're working with him and trying to help him. Now they're talking about, you know, next steps for him. And so you've spent a, a, a lot of time with, with the young player trying to help him, you know, advance his career. And, and again, no, nobody wants to hear that you're not wanted or I don't want to be part of it. Nobody wants to hear that. But when you get to that decision, I, I do believe that, that, that you have to say, listen, I, I don't want to come to Winnipeg. Whatever it is, I don't want to come to Winnipeg. I want to be closer to home. I want, whatever, whatever. I do mm -hmm. think that you owe that to the team that is that, that is invested time into you right and a selection and like i said it doesn't have to be public 
but 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 I think that you know I I would hope that you know as, as hard as it may be uh, for a team to hear it, as hard as it may be for a, for a player or to, to say it, I I think that okay we understand now we all now we all can move on and and again that's I, I think Rutgers is a really good player and a good person, but you know. Kevin Shovel Day off. He's pretty darn good at taking situations and turning them around and, and not losing an advantage because Braden Yeager is a really good player. <laughs> Craig Button, our guest Saturday morning. It's the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk, Ezra Ginsburg joined by TSN Director of Scouting and, of course, Winnipeg Jets analyst Craig Button. Craig, unlike Dave, I watched all of your work on the broadcast last, <laughs> last night with Sarah. So I, I heard, I heard. Just kidding, Dave. Uh, obviously, I heard you guys talking a little bit about the Central Division, and everybody knows that the Avalanche and the Predators—they're not off to the start that they would like. And I, I got to specifically ask you about Colorado because the Jets lost in five games to Colorado, and we all know that Colorado beat the Ducks last night. They needed overtime to beat the Ducks, uh, but that was their first win of the season. So I, I got to ask you now that you're on our show, uh, how concerned are you with with the Avalanche start to the season? Because obviously there's injuries and the goaltending hasn't been good. But I mean, a lot of people, myself included, thought that it was just a given that the Avalanche would be a you know a top three team in the Central. Count me among them, Ezra, as, a, as, as someone who thought they'd be a, a top three team. And I, I felt at the beginning of the year, over the summer, after watching what Nashville did, I, I felt Dallas, Winnipeg, Nashville, and Colorado. Like I, I think those four teams that comprise uh, the top end of the Central Derrick, there was nobody, there was no division that had that type of quality in in, in their top four teams. And then and even I was asked. I mean, I know I I, I do you know predictions and whatnot. I, I said like any one of those teams could finish first. Any one of those teams could finish fourth. And I thought they were all good. And last year, three te- three of those teams had 100 points, and Nashville bumped right up to near 100 points. So it wasn't about you know, they have to take these leaps. They were there uh, last year. So now to answer your question, I mean, last night, I believe it was the 45th shot of the game <laughs> that it took before uh, McKinnon put the puck in and, 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 and they ended up winning. And Anaheim had 19 shots on goal. Mm-hmm. And e- even the time goal by Troy Terry, it, it's just another example of, of, of a real weakness for the Colorado Avalanche. The goaltending's been been it, it it hasn't even been American Hockey League level, and you know, like yeah, we know they have injuries. So a lot of teams have that, right? But w- when you play well enough, and your goaltender can't stop anything, like you have no chance. I, I don't care if you have injuries or you don't have injuries, you have no chance. And your you have at this point in time ha- has been beyond poor. He he just hasn't been there. And, and even last night, they're up three two. I mean. Troy Terry takes a shot from outside the 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 the, the dot uh, on an angle that isn't great, and all of a sudden with seven, I think it was seven seconds left in the game, or just fifteen seconds, whatever it was. <laughs> Colorado's going, oh my god, not again, not again. And I think Chris McFarland has to address it. I think he, I think he has to go out and find a goaltender. You know, Craig, the Jets have a lot of fun prospects in the pipeline. Kevin, he has a Two days ago Ooh. was leading the OHL. His motor just doesn't seem <laughs> he to. Hot. Uh, he hot. He hot. He is hot. He is him, but it doesn't seem to stop. You know, Braden Yeager, who you're talking about, he had a goal and assist yesterday for Moose Jaw. He looks like a real good player from what we saw here in Winnipeg when he was at training camp. The one I want to ask you about, though, is Colby Barlow. Because, of course, he was the subject of conversation throughout leading up to the season. He was going to go to, um, didn't want to go back to Owen Sound. Wasn't really made official. And then he gets traded to Oshawa. He picked up his first assist yesterday. He had a, a the game winner in a shootout for, for the Generals. But my question for you is in terms of how long does it take to, for a player? And I know there's not one answer, but from a guy getting acclimatized to a new team in a new market for someone like Colby Barlow, who, like I said, picked up his first assist in seven games yesterday. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I mean, I think Colby's a, 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 a terrific uh, young person. I think he's a really good player and a really good prospect. He was the captain in Owen Sound. And so, you know, as a young player who 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 really was such an integral part of their leadership and and, and did it on and off the ice in, in, in such an exemplary fashion, I, I think they're in, in the, you know, for other players that don't have kind of that that, that footing, that that, in, uh, that foothold in, in a market and with an organization, I think it might be a little bit easier. I think for Colby, probably the hardest thing for Colby was saying, you know, I need to be somewhere else. 
And 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 again, we, we were talking about Rutger. Colby is is kind of saying like, you know what? I'm going to leave Owen Sound, and that doesn't come easy for for Colby Barlow. I, I, like I, I he hasn't I, I I haven't talked to him, I, but I know him, and I know that wouldn't come easy to him. So now you're trying to settle into a new play. How do I fit in? I mean, Colby has always been a player that has been somebody that I'm going to take a hold of things and I'm going to make my presence known. And I'm going to like, he doesn't need to wear a C to be a leader. He's just, he's just a leader period. And I think that now trying to find your way in a new organization and and with younger players. And I think Colby has, has a really good, strong understanding of with younger players. You don't want to overpower them. You know, the NHL is a little bit different. The players are older, more mature. You don't want to be a, a 19 year old player and overpower kids. And, you know, you, you want to work with them. And I think that that's what makes Colby such a good leader. And so, so I think it is taking him a little bit of time there. And, but I, I don't think there's any question that he'll settle in and he'll be, he'll be really productive and, and, and he'll find his leadership voice and his leadership role in Ostrawa. But but the but you know we we expect sometimes a change. Okay, he's just going there; it'll change quickly. He he'll be right back on fire. He'll be fine. I, I'm not worried. I mean, there, there's certain players that you just go, yeah, I'm not so worried. It was it, I'll just share this with you guys because you talked about Jaeger and they and they they played Medicine Hat last night. I was in Medicine Hat on Wednesday, and you know people, what's wrong with Gavin McKenna? What's wrong with Gavin? I'm at the game. They lost eight one to Prince George. And Gavin McKenna was brilliant. <laughs> we, we we tend to look at the score sheet and go like, well, he doesn't have a, he doesn't have this. And then you watch the game, you go, he, he has the puck every time he's out on the ice. He all kinds of scoring chances. The Ravensburg and the, the goaltender for Rich George was excellent. And I would imagine that Colby, you know, he, he wants to score. He wants to contribute offensively. But I would imagine without having seen Oshawa play that he's probably doing – uh, some positive things to help that team, uh, you know, win games. You know, Greg, I just want to get what your thought on the idea of ice time management. We saw it with the Sharks where they're resting a young guy here in Manitoba with, with Chaz Lucius, who's the 2021 first rounder. He's a prospect. He's looked really good in camp. His skating looks excellent. Of course, he had the surgery on his ankle last year. But the Moose seemed to be slowly getting him back. And and they, he didn't play him last week in Iowa for the first couple of games. They played him for the first game last night in Grand Rapids. We'll see if he goes in the rematch tonight, but it just seems to be a smart decision, but it seems to be one that's kind of a little bit out there for hockey is getting these guys to, to, to maximize them. So you don't do some, you know, long-term damage to get some short-term gain. Absolutely, Dave. And I, I think with Chaz's injury history, there's also that. So, you know, you're, you, and, and certainly you, you draft a player in the first round and, and Chaz has, has, uh, has, 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 has ability and talent. We, we know that. But now what you're trying to do coming off the ankle surgery, you want to make sure that a player is not only uh, healthy, but ready to get back in. Because, you, you know, there's a difference between rehabbing an injury and healing an injury and then stepping back into the lineup and being ready to play because the the level of play is high. And so you have to be very cognizant when you put a player back in. Yeah, his injury may be healed, but is he ready to get in and is he ready to take on the demands and 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 the rigors of, of playing so that you don't put him at risk? Because you might put you might put the player at risk of of something else and you know maybe a different type of injury because you're not in game shape. You you, you know and so again, managing that, working with the with with the player uh to, to help him understand okay listen you're gonna play game one here you might not play game two but ultimately what we're trying to do is is get you into a place where you're gonna be able to play all the games and be confident and be ready to do it and I think for Chaz that's really important for him and other players you know to to your point Dave you know other teams we saw it last year with Leo Carlson in Anaheim Pat Verbeek was very open he's not gonna play every game period and 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 he Pat, Pat even went one step further he said we're not going to rob our home fans of him. He, he won't play back-to-backs on the road. He, he might not play the third game in four days on the road. We're not going to rob him, our fans at home. You're going to see Leo. And so you manage him. He plays at home. You know, he can, he can do some other things on the road. Bob Ganey uh, used to tell the young players, and, and he used to tell our coaches when he was managing our, our team in Dallas, he used to say, like, you know, the game looks really easy from the press box. And sometimes you need to see how easy it looks by being in the press box. <laughs> like, don't look at it as a negative. And, and, and I think that, 
you know, it's not just saying you're not going to play. You got to get in there and, and learn and grow. And I think for I think for Chaz and I, 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 people say, oh yeah, you're just you're you're just a, a, a Jets supporter. And I I like the Jets and I like the people of Jets. But when when I talk about what, what a terrific job they do and what they since the day they got the franchise back in 2011 with with Mark Chipman and, and Kevin Shovel Dayoff and the group they have in there. I, I think that they're a model for, for doing things right in the National Hockey League, from drafting, from development, from taking situations, valuing their players, making moves. I, I really do. I, I have great admiration for the work they do. And certainly, uh, the, in my view, they have good people, but Dave, it's just another example of, of doing what they believe is right. Last question for you, Craig. You talk about great admiration. There's great admiration in Winnipeg for Brian Little, and he's going to get oh. that acknowledgement <laughs> tomorrow afternoon, retiring, signing a one-day contract to retire as a member of the Winnipeg Jets. Just, you know, a memory or two, you know, uh, that you have of Brian Little, you know, tracking his career from his time in Barrie through Atlanta to the untimely end here in Winnipeg. When you think about Brian, right, and, and and Brian was 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 what I would call a a, a a warrior, like you know, like he he had skill. But when you watched him play, and and going all the way back to junior hockey, watching him play in Barry, like he 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 was getting right in the thick of things, and and he had skill. Don't get me wrong, he had skill. He could shoot the puck. He could he could handle it. He he could make plays. But he, but he was he he had a warrior mentality. He, he really did. And, you know, when, when, and it, we all know that Brian wasn't the biggest of players, but he, you knew that you were going to get uh, a, a great effort and, and, and from, from Brian Little when he was on, when he was on the ice. His determination ha- had no limits. I mean, he, he always wanted to try to find a way to, to get through resistance, to find a way to help the team win. And, you know, when, when, when I think – I just think of Brian as somebody, and, and, and again – I, I ask myself this, and it's a little bit different with what I do now than when I was with an NHL team in terms of scouting. The first question I would ask myself, when I still ask myself this, but it's a little bit different because when you're with a team, you, you can you, you can just say, you know, that player doesn't fit for us. What I do now in the scouting, I'm trying to give a picture of the players, and so 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 I'm I'm, I'm giving a picture of all the players. I'm not saying he doesn't fit from. I'm not with a team, but when I, when I was with teams, the first question is, can you win with them? Can you win with this player? There was never, ever a doubt with Brian Little that, that you could not win, that, that, that that wasn't the case, that the answer was always yes. And that, to me, is the type of player that you want on your team. Craig Button, TSN Director of Scouting Analyst on TSN Jets Broadcast. Thanks again for joining us this morning. You heard always it here first. Gavin up. McKenna is still good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yeah, Greg. Yeah, he's good. He might he <laughs> Thanks, might go guys. first overall, right, Craig? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, like he, he should, but I'll tell you what, there's a heck of a player playing in Windsor and that's gonna be in that draft. His name is Ethan Belshatz. And he's six foot five in skill. Now listen, McKenna's brilliant. I'm just saying that just keep that name in mind that he's a really good player. I, I don't I don't think he can I don't I don't see him uh, as being capable of unseating Gavin, but we're looking at a pretty pretty good draft uh, in 2026. Well, the first Craigslist is, I'm sure, uh, in works or soon to be released, right? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Something to look forward to. Craig, thank you. We'll see you again soon. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. You, you too, too Craig. Craig. Great friend of ours, Craig Button, joining us this morning on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. He's just, he's the best. I mean, what can you say about Craig? He joins us for so many years uh, in a row now, and he always brings great insight, and it's great to see him on the broadcast with Sarah again as well. Uh, I was talking to Sarah it. about that yesterday. She's back in, she's back in the fold. Yeah, in business. It's great to, you know, adds just adds another element of quality uh, to the TS. I kept telling her to give us more icy shout outs on it. But, you know, she said, who are you and why are you here? And and it's, you know, it's a good back and forth. It's it's the banter that we all enjoy and love. Uh, Big thanks to Craig Button. Big thanks to Murata Tesh for joining us this morning on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Was Murat, was the dog that Murat was house sitting, was that, was it Poco or Poco? I think Poco. Poco. Poco too. It came across like a Pogo Pogo stick, but. You know, whatever. You Poco's know, whatever a big girl. Poco is. We already yeah. did the sorry. T. Cohen Paul is asking. We already did a moose minute yesterday. I will yeah. do a quick prospect roundup, Drew. A very quick one, if you'll, if you'll. Why don't you do it tomorrow? Me... Tomorrow no, on the post game show. Because there'll be a whole new one tomorrow. 
I'm just going to say quickly, Zach right, Naring, right. who you haven't paid a lot of attention to, 2023 third rounder, Western Michigan. He had two goals, one assist. He's off to a good start in the college hockey. And of course, like I said, Colby Barlow, Braden Yeager, and Marcus Lupinen over in Victoria as he scored his second goal of the season in queuing the comeback for the Royals. And so that's uh, the, and Kevin, he, for the first time, got held off the score sheet in his first game. So he is now second in OHL scoring, but he is a very exciting prospect and one I'm sure Jets fans are going to be very excited to watch. There's the Dave Manuk prospect report. Big thanks to our sponsors, Play Now, the title sponsor of our programming, our friends at Rumors Restaurant and Comedy Club, Maddie Smith there tonight. Two shows, 7.15 and 9.45. Holt Dental City Place will be there on Monday, October 28th, getting you set for the Jets and the Maple Leafs. That's a noon hour show. So spend your lunch hour with us at City Place, Boston Pizza, and Seagram. Support these fine businesses because of their continued support of Illegal Curve Hawk. In case you missed any of the show, the instant replay is available on the YouTube channel. The podcast will be up shortly as well. If you haven't already done so, smash the like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the podcast, and leave us feedback here, there, and everywhere. We want to hear what you have to think about our program. We're next in action tomorrow after the Jets and the Penguins, right around 4.30, 4.45, somewhere in that vicinity for the Illegal Curve post-game show. IllegalCurve.com will have all your latest Winnipeg jets and manitoba moose news and audio jets practice in one hour time so stay tuned to the website for everything coming out of jets practice for dave manuk for ezra ginsburg i'm your host room and thanks for joining us everybody if it's saturday it's the illegal curve hockey show live on our youtube and all of our social media platforms thanks for listening to this broadcast from illegal curve hockey for more great illegal curve content subscribe to the illegal curve youtube channel Follow at Illegal Curve on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and visit your online home for hockey in Winnipeg, IllegalCurve.com.